Space is dropped on a new edition of Soccer Down Here. It's a Friday. It's a Freestyle Friday, and it will definitely be a Freestyle Friday as we've got news and updates and rumors out of the United States, out of England, out of France, out of Argentina, out of Brazil. I'm sure we'll hit a few more countries along the way, uh, but it's, it's a busy Friday. There's lots of stuff going on ahead of a weekend coming up with some big games. Arsenal-Manchester United is a huge one. Um, also, waiting on MLS updates, and the deadline last night has passed. It was at midnight, I'm assuming Eastern time, uh, for we think either the end of negotiations between the MLSPA and the league about CBA modifications based off the force majeure clause being invoked. That's a whole phrase that I did not expect to be using on soccer programming on a regular basis, but welcome to 2020 and 2021. Uh, We haven't seen an update yet. We know the players did submit a revised counter proposal that did ask or or agree to extending the CBA for one year, not two. And there were some other slight modifications. Again, we don't know the parameters. It feels like they are headed in the right direction. I feel a lot better about it after that MLSPA announcement um, waiting on updates. And we will keep you posted because I would assume we'd have some this morning with the deadline that had been talked about being at midnight last night. Didn't see any late night updates. Didn't see any uh, 3 a.m. updates from anybody. So this is where we're at. We'll keep you posted. Uh, but we got a ton of other stuff to talk to. We've also got Jarrett Smith crashing the party for a little while this morning. It's been a fun week with Jarrett hanging out. I'm just here to break things. Yeah, you should. That's usually what you do. This is John accurate. Spirit with Swansea. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, there's lots of things that you guys like to uh, break and complain about. Are you still ha- you still mad, happy, whatever about Mindy Kaling, John? I am guardedly optimistic right now. Could because... you ever not be guardedly optimistic? What do you want me to say? I'm waiting for the bottom to fall out. No, that's not. I'm I'm saying guardedly. How about just being optimistic? Just maybe being this man's been around Atlanta sports and too many great cups not to have at least some guardedness. True, it's that, not that just accurate. some guardedness, Jarrett. It's a dark cloud of misery that flows over his head on far Jarrett, too often of a regular basis. Jarrett, do you want to go ahead and requote what you just said? No, just you're looking for ago. justification, yeah. John. Yeah, and just a second ago. No, no, oh, no, yeah. no, 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 no. <laughs> you're looking for justification because last time I checked, I got some bona fides in Atlanta, y'all. I've been here. I've done that. Add in being a Georgia fan and dealing with what they've been doing the last few years. Mm. Um, Yeah. So don't give me the, oh, Atlanta sports, it's so bad. I'm going to cry every time I think about it because there's a big mean cloud of Bruce Benedict and Steve Bartkowski and all these things. Big mean cloud of Bruce Benedict. Yeah, don't give me this That's nonsense. an amazing turn of phrase that I have never expected to hear in my life. Don't give me big this nonsense. Bruce Benedict. I, cherry, I will cherish that to my grave. The, the sun is shining and it's a lovely day. And that's what we're going to talk about around here on Soccer Down here today. It's no guarded optimism, folks. We're going to be happy today. We've got lots of things. No, Bruce Benedict. Yes, we're 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 going to be happy today. All right. Can you Um, make that into a shirt? Yeah, really. That might be a shirt. Sorry, Bruce. (laughs) Bruce went on to be a great uh, SEC basketball referee. Actually, yes, was very cool. Yes, he was, and there, and he actually did the high school ranks too. And so, when when you're calling games and you see Bruce Benedict running up and down the floor, you're like, hey, wait a minute. Yep. But not he's the solid official in his yeah. in his baseball life. Yeah, very good. Very good. So that's referee. how I that's how I felt uh covering youth football over at uh over in Buckhead a couple of years ago. I was when we were getting ready to like call the championships and I looked down and I'm like, 
That coach is extremely swole. Oh, that's Jerrell Bettis. His kid played over in uh, NYL football. Do it. His kid once at one point, his kid juked another kid, like almost blew the kid's knees out. He juked him so hard <laughs> and ran past him. And I thought Bettis was gonna like bust a blood vessel because his son didn't run the kid over and instead ran past him. <sighs> Look, I know some he people did not engineered to truck people. Yeah, some people did not have Bruce Benedict on the SDH bingo card this morning. Uh, <laughs> they they also did not have rumors of Aaron Long to Liverpool on no. the bingo card this morning. But look, y'all, it makes a lot of sense, right? Liverpool's yeah. got defensive issues. Liverpool needs some extra bodies, and they don't need them long term necessarily. They they can decide that in the summertime, but. They they got to get somebody in, Fabinho, Joel Matip. I mean, it, it's like everybody just keeps going down. You put a guy at center back and they get hurt. You know, you bring in somebody who's never played center back. You put him in that position, they get hurt. It's like the Spinal Tap drummer. So, yes, it is. It is Mick Shrimpton at center back for Liverpool. Sorry, I, I used a reference from the eighties and I got John excited. My bad. Um, Aaron Long at center back on a short term loan makes a ton of sense. It makes a ton of sense. They need somebody short term. He's an experienced guy. Is he going to be the best center back in the Premier League? Probably not. But can he come in and do the job with all these injuries? Yeah, he can. And it's a smart move. And it gets his foot in the door at a big club, and he can show what he can do. And if it doesn't mean he sticks around there, it means that he could go somewhere else, which he's been really close to moves. He's been linked to moves. He was linked to a move... Uh, in the championship here recently. But, yeah, Liverpool needs somebody like that. They need a short-term, six-month, hey, we need somebody who can step in with all these injuries we're dealing with. You look like you can fit the bill. Yeah, but yesterday it was Reading. Was, that was the, the team that was being mentioned in the, the championship for Aaron Long. And Jurgen Klopp, after yesterday's match, said that there aren't any 80 million pound center backs out there. So... It has to be the right fit. It has to be the you know. It has to be the the right guy, since you can't go chasing after that eight figure uh, that eight figure pickup. And Aaron Long does make a lot of sense. You, you need somebody short term because you're going to be looking in the summertime at you know Open Meccano possibly. You're going to try to swoop in there. Uh, Liverpool sounds like they're still possibly talking about David Alaba, who has not officially done anything with Real Madrid yet. Hey, Liverpool, Sergio Ramos is going to be out of contract in the summer, too. I'm just telling you, you might want to add him. That'd be pretty cool. I'd love to see how that one gets spun. <laughs> God, just embrace the heel do roll it. so hard. Do it. It'd be please. amazing. Do it, Liverpool. I mean, do you're it. probably going to move I mean, Mo Salah that, anyway, so you know you don't have any worries about that. So just oh, go God, sign just Sergio do a Ramos. Switch. Just do a swap yeah. with cash. Play your swap sure. with cash going, the, going, coming your way if you're Liverpool. Sure. Just do it. It'll be funny. I'll, I'll be entertained anyway. Um, they'll be able to solve the problem, and you'll get people back from injury in the summer. You need somebody quickly. You're probably going to have to get a loan done. This would be one that would be interesting to see where it goes. And another one I didn't have on the, the bingo card this morning is Pitti Martinez, possibly on the move. Uh, Al Nasser's having some problems paying salaries, which is kind of a problem when you've been throwing money around willy-nilly, um, briefcases full of cash. Maybe it was... Yeah. Uh, as was said on the Discord this morning, maybe it was the ones under the hundreds. Yes. Is, uh, a common trick. Um, Mike on the Brazilian, he took his case to FIFA saying he hadn't been paid in six months. There's talk about Pitti not being paid. There's rumors about him going potentially to a Mexican club. I'd assume it'd be Club America. That's the, the one that seems to make the most sense and could pay him you know, in the ballpark of what I think he'd be looking for. Uh, there's also a thought, and it, it feels like a thought at this point rather than a possibility of him going back to River. And I would assume that if he can't find anybody who would pay him bigger money, yeah, River could come into play because I think they'd probably at least pay him. And, you know, I mean, he's not getting paid, it sounds like, and he's not the only one. Uh, it's a shame. I mean, I, I hope the uh, the transfers are being paid. Al Nasser, yeah, there was one here at, locally that I, I hope that check cleared or yeah. everything's on the up and up there because you can't be in this spot for very long. 
And you're going to hear more about clubs like this. You're going to hear more about situations like this. We'll go down to Argentina to a club that has also been in the news with Atlanta United, Independiente. The Argentine Federation has informed Independiente that they are banned from signing players until a $360,000 debt to a former defender is paid. They owe money to a player. They haven't paid him. They got to pay it because they can't sign any players until that. Eric Rometty has been linked to Independiente. He's also been linked to San Lorenzo. They can't add anybody. Now, the club's expected to pay that debt today. I, I guess they were just sitting on the money um, and get that ban lifted in 48 hours. So this is going to happen more places. Y- you've got some French clubs that this kind of talk has been going around. You've got some Scottish clubs that are going to be in this kind of situation. When players aren't getting paid according to their contracts, they can take it to FIFA, and FIFA and, lo- and domestic federations will put bans on clubs from signing players and adding players. And it gets really tricky. It gets really, really tricky. So that's a very wild run of of stuff this morning. But that's what the kind of day it feels like. We're getting to the end of the transfer window. So you're hearing about things like Aaron Long and, and Liverpool. You're also hearing about clubs who need to sell, players who want to move because they're not happy where they are. This is only going to get wackier over the next couple of days. Uh, The windows all close at various local times on Monday. And and that's where I think you'll start to see a flurry of activity right at the end. Because we haven't seen a ton. We are in the midst of a global pandemic and record losses for for businesses in, in the game. You know, MLS, I think, has signed one designated player in this January window or in this this period right now, they can still sign guys after this. But normally they've signed a lot more. Well, losses, pandemic, not a whole lot of money, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you're not seeing a lot of moves in England either. You know, that's, that's kind of been the, the, the news update here lately is where are all the moves? There's been talk about moves. Where are the moves? Well, money's a little hard to come by. I think as you get closer to the window closing on Monday, you'll see some things go down. Because I think you could see the flip side of that, Jarrett, and see some clubs that need to sell and need to bring in some money have to do it at the last minute. Because if they don't, you're looking at six months of either little revenue or no revenue because of empty stadiums. And if that's your last shot, well... You might cash in your chips. You're going to have to do something. Um, <clears throat> some of these places are going to need the influx of cash that comes with, um, you know, possibly like the Scottish government floating more money coming their way. Or, uh, you know, Aberdeen, it sounds like they're going to move Sam Cosgrove. Uh, this is a move that they had talked about doing, I think, last summer. Yeah. And he shot it down. He didn't want to go. Um, now it sounds like he's going to go to the championship. But that probably won't be the last one. Like some of those clubs, and today could get dumb, or th- today, um, the, the end of this, the end of this window could get dumb. Time is fluid. I mean, if you really want to have fun with it. Uh, let them all reach into a bowl and grab a ball that tells them the exact hour upon which their transfer window closes, and make each country different. Let's just get done with it because you're probably going to see a lot of rumors, and this is going to be a. Uh, a time of make sure you check the Twitter account you're looking at. Make sure it's verified and make sure it's not a fake account. It is always fake account season, but it is prime fake account season right now. Yeah, like the one that was going around there for a minute about Seattle signing Carlos Tevez for $10 million. That was amazing. Yeah, Extra underscore on Tato Aguilera's <laughs> um Twitter account. That, that was not a real Tato Aguilera from Teise. That was a fake one. Seattle's not paying $10 million for Carlos Tevez. Carlos Tevez isn't going anywhere. He made that pretty clear at the end of uh, the Copa Diego Armando Maradona. He's going to stay at Boca. So be careful. Check those follower accounts. Make sure they're yes. legit. And make yes. sure you're not getting imposters because it, it's going to get weird. A question from Perfect Tommy on the, the Twitch pitch. Is the Caicedo deal going to get done for Brighton? It's been talked about all month, and we haven't seen anything yet. Uh, Do they have the money? Are are they going to be able to raise the money? Are we going to see a GoFundMe pop up at at a Brighton here very soon? I don't know. And this is where MLS is in a really interesting spot. 
and this is where getting things done with the labor agreement is vital. It's even more vital than usual. You just said, and, and Jarrett pointed out, you got Aberdeen, right? Aberdeen has been very upfront about their financials, and they're not your, you know, average European club, but there's a lot of clubs in this kind of situation. Okay? They need money. They have a player they maybe would have liked to have held on for a little bit longer, maybe would have loved to have had him for the rest of the season. They need cash. Flat yep. out. And they've been very upfront about this. So they make the deal now. A couple million bucks. Okay. Got it done. That's going to probably see you through the rest of this, this, at least this season, maybe even the rest of this year when you look at the numbers that, that they've been putting out there because they've been very upfront about their financial position. All right. Clubs are not going to be able to buy in most countries, not all, but most around the world, most major leagues, after Monday. Except for Major League Soccer. Yep. Because their window stays open through May, through the beginning of May. So let's say Moises Caicedo doesn't get done. It, it, it can't happen. Okay? What happens if Brighton doesn't get it done? Independiente del Valle still wants to make a move. Oh, yeah, that MLS offer that was really good. Hmm. Maybe we go back to that. Other players that deals don't get done and clubs still need to bring in some money in February. Hmm. Let's call up our friends over in MLS. Maybe they'd be interested in this player for a good deal. We could really use that $2.5 million right now to uh, pay our bills for the rest of the season. Okay, let's do it. it. It's a really unique spot that MLS has to be ready to take advantage of. And that means they have to get this thing done. And whatever it takes, get the deal signed. Let's have an announcement today. Let's be ready to move if you're Major League Soccer because I got a feeling... There could be some players available that could really flip the scales of the quality of this league in 2021 if you guys are ready to operate. You mentioned Moises Caicedo. Yesterday we were talking about the finances for Brighton in general and how much money they had lost or, and were losing. And yes, the, it does put the, the, uh, the ethereal question mark over your head. It does put that thought bubble that you see in cartoons over your head about these deals in these situations. How bad off are clubs? Can they make a deal happen? And where MLS is right now, they're in that spot where you need to get something done because you can take advantage of the world situation right now because of where your window is set and where your league is staggered when it comes to bringing in players. It's a, it's a moment of opportunity but the league has to get everything squared away with the CBA so they can take advantage of this window of opportunity to continue to grow on the world stage. It's, it's their chance to jump on this and really make an impact. Now, slow down. I don't want anybody to start thinking that Moises Caicedo is up for grabs yet. As, okay, so as an example, uh, yeah, let's right, put it uh, that uh, way. Slow down. I don't want anybody to think like it's not getting done. There, there's right. reports every other day, and they're all from various sources. Like, oh, a five-year deal is done on a contract for him. Everything's ready to go. It just hasn't happened yet. Right. There, unlike the MLS CBA conversation where there's some kind of a deadline. We don't know if it's a hard deadline, a soft deadline, a real deadline, a fake deadline. We don't know. We know there's a deadline with the transfer window. If the deal's not done, the deal's not done. And if the deal's not done, that's where MLS can knock on the door and come crashing into the party and say, hello, we're here to hang out. Mm -hmm. Because they can still bring players in. And it's why you got to get this stuff done with the CBA. We'll keep you posted on the updates as we go, but it's going to get weird on the transfer front because of a lot of external pressures on the finances right now. Um, there's just no way around it. It's it's going to become an issue with this window. Clubs would like to do business. They can't. They can't spend any money. Clubs need to do business because they need to sell people, and they got to find somebody to buy. Clubs have footballing concerns like Liverpool – they need a defender. They're probably going to have to sort out a loan because of just where things stand right now. There's no need to to panic buy at the moment. Go get a loan. Go get that sorted out. You're going to see some differences in the January window as this thing comes to a close on Monday. And I don't know which way it goes. 
Uh, I think you could see some big surprises, and I think if MLS is ready to operate in a big way February 2, you could see MLS benefit from this. This could be the opportunity with guys who thought they would move, didn't move, guys who need to move from their clubs because they're going to need to bring in money like an Independiente who needs to pay some bills. And and this isn't the only player, by the way. This this transfer ban that has resulted for Independiente because of three hundred and sixty grand that hasn't been paid. Cecilio Dominguez was in this spot. That's why how he ended up to Austin. Because Independiente owed Club America money on a transfer involving him that was backdated. There's other players. They are trying to bring in reportedly a player like Eric Rometty. They can't right now. But they're sitting on a player in Alan Velasco, who is looked at as the one of the best young Argentine talents at the moment. And Matias Martinez of Radio La Red in Argentina reported yesterday that an unnamed MLS club offered Independiente $14 million for Alan Velasco. Independiente is valuing him at $24 million, so they turned it down. He's valued at twenty four million. Like that's legit. You got to see this kid play. He's he is a very very good talent. So, Independiente is in debt. Independiente has a an asset fourteen twenty four million. You divide the difference. You come up with a number, and boom, maybe those debts are solved. Right? Yeah. These are the kinds of things that can happen. It's gonna get it's gonna get funky going to get really really funky uh just like Jarrett celtic gets a little funky what's the update on your boys Jarrett? i need you to gripe a little bit about celtic <laughs> i mean i was gonna actually make it a couple days I, I had a coin waiting for me and everything for making it a couple days without complaining about them but sure yeah go let's go ahead and break that streak um <laughs> apparently sobriety's for quitters when it comes to celtic it yes is. that's accurate uh yeah, so it sounds like Peter Lowell is going to be out. The who is the uh, the man in charge above uh, above Neil Lennon, and that is CEO. That is who. Is that right? Yeah, that's who, that's who you want to go if you're wanting a, an overhaul here. Because if you're worried about you know the meritocracy of Celtic continuing, then that's what you need. Um, you need him not to be in that position anymore, and then you need someone to come in and say, "We're not going to hire anyone we know." That would help. Yeah. Yeah. Because I guarantee you, like, every time this every time this opens, somebody yells about Henrik Larsson, because I think he's managing in Sweden, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it's like second division. And he is a club legend. Um, but, uh, I mean, this is the first step to actually removing the wart, is getting down in there and actually getting it out of the root, which in this case is Peter Lowell. So... That's that's the good first move at this point. I fully expect them to just ride this out with the Alenin. And in the midst of all of this, they've somehow still made money because they brought in Jeremy Frempong for 300000 and just flipped him to Bayer Leverkusen to, for $10 million because he wanted out. And in like a day's time, he said, yeah, I don't want to be here anymore. Cool, we'll send you to Germany and pocket a cool $10 million for you for a right back who is incredibly fast. But um, not exactly accurate with a cross. That's a problem. Mm-hmm. It is, but you know, good on them for actually finding a way to make money in all of this. You know, I fully expect, um, I fully expect there to be more rumors in the next over the weekend, really going into going into next week, because you still have the Olsen Edward rumors, and um, you know anyone else who inter- is interested in leaving, go ahead and start pocketing that money because you're. Uh, you're not going to win trophies. The money that comes to trophies this year, and you 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 really angered a lot of the fan base for doing the virtual season ticket purchase for next year. That's not going to go over well. So you might want to just go ahead and pocket cash. Same way that Aberdeen's doing. Um, yeah, that's the thing. That's, I'm glad that's Sam funny. Cosgrove finally left. I yeah, was really nervous right. that Cosgrove was going to refuse to leave, and Aberdeen was going to sit there and go, "No, no, you need to go. We no, we need the money. Yeah, go. Yeah." The virtual season ticket thing is good when you have a good relationship with your fan base. Uh, when they're uh, protesting outside of your stadium because of uh, plonkerness that is going on um, in your squad and in your team and in your front office, 
kind of hard to go for the virtual season ticket thing. You know, people aren't really going to support you too much when you're you're creating these disputes. Uh, Jared, is there anything else left on the table for you and Celtic? I, I mean, mean, there's. I found, oh, I found out, I found out Larson's, play for. Larson's an assistant back at Barcelona now. Oh, good for him. Thanks, I know he got into management. Um, yeah, two tours at well it, Yeah, I couldn't remember how well it went for him, but, um, you know, I mean, go be an assistant somewhere and, you know, sharpen up. Uh, you know, best of luck to him. You're going to get Frank Lampard, Jarrett. Just get ready for it. Oh. You know what? I'm... I'm not as angry at that as I thought I would be when I first thought about it. Um, just because it might be a good, it might be a good, uh, this might be a, this might be a renovation project. We, we might be in an episode of fixer upper with Celtic. Oh and, yeah. Uh, no, you're going to need to be Frank Lampard's rolling up in here like chip gains. Okay. We're going to th- we're going to throw some ship lap on this thing. We're going to open up, they're going to run an open concept, put some exposed beams in there. Because ship lap fixes everything. You know, this, only in Waco, Texas. True. But mm-hmm. I, 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 if it is Frank Lampard, I'm, it's whatever. Um, it, it's not going to be the current administration, so that's fine. Uh, yeah, what, you talk about, I mean, it, you talk about ruining that relationship. This time last year, the relationship with the fans was good. Some yeah. of that was because Rangers was currently setting itself on fire like a protesting monk. But now you're in a situation where you've completely ruined that in less than a calendar year. you got to rebuild it somehow. All right, so here's your numbers on the courtesy of our friends at Odds Checker for the new manager at Celtic, next permanent manager. Here's your numbers. Who do you think the leader in the clubhouse is? I would think it's either Lampard or Rafa. It's Rafa, Rafa. because that's where you're going to get money on, on bids, but yeah, I don't Rafa's think he's going there. Bet. Yeah, it's a sucker bet. Five to six right now. Rafa Benitez is your number one. Who's your number two? Lampard. That is correct. At seven to two, Frank Lampard is number two right name. now. Yeah, I mean, it's another name. Then your number three. There are two other managers who are less than 10 to one odds. Who's your number three? No clue. Eddie Howe at five to one. Eddie Howe's been linked to that job for a year. Yeah, I don't like. think he's going there. And Roy Keane is the other one. Sorry, uh, Alex Neal is the other one who is less than 10 to 1. It's 7 to 1 in most places. I think what happens is Celtic finally moves on from Neil Lennon after the season. I think they make a run at Rafa. They make a run at Lampard. They strike out on both, and they end up hiring Roy Keane. That's my bold you prediction. Wouldn't have to worry about guys getting up to the game. No, I'd be terrified if they didn't. That is that is accurate. That is definitely true. Um, let's get into the MLS Gosh. stuff just a little <laughs> bit here, uh, rather than Celtic down here. Sorry, Jarrett. The, um, the Diego Costa bomba from Taise too, please. <laughs> oh, we've got a Diego Costa bomba. Uh huh. Taise Sport to Diego Costa a Boca. Well, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. Last hours, a rumor has emerged that could that they could Boca could uh, could at least ask about it. So let's start the Diego Costa off the Boca train. Well, you got that, and you've got Juan Arango uh, with that Alan Velasco rumor that we mentioned just a little bit ago, and tying Atlanta United to it, um, which is not a surprise. I mean, we've seen Atlanta spend that kind of money with this club before and in South America before, and Alan Velasco is a top young talent that will have a resale value. It absolutely checks all the boxes. Uh, Welcome to the end of silly season. And and that's just in some parts of the world. The MLS silly season will continue on and on and on and on. We'll we'll come back to rumors real quick. Let's, before we get an update, just so everybody kind of knows where things stand on, on the MLS front. uh, I mentioned that there had been a counter proposal from the players yesterday. And that, Included extending the CBA one year um, to 2026. They said that they've already made the concessions of 150 million by extending the CBA another year. Those concessions would reach 200 million. I think 
the estimates on the league side with extending it two years was a hundred to a hundred and ten million that they would save. So cutting it in half around fifty. Yeah, that that makes sense. Uh, the proposal also included a reduction in age for free agents eligibility, I believe from twenty four to twenty three. Some restrictions on free agent earnings. Uh, it also dialed back the bumps on the cap later in the CBA that the league had proposed to the players. So, you know, what does all that mean in in English from what we can tell? The players are willing to give back some money to be able to negotiate a year earlier than the league proposed. I think it ultimately comes down to that. 2026 is not some strange year to pull out of this and try to balance around either. That's when a World Cup is coming to this country. There's an expectation that it will improve MLS's business with more interest in the game, more interest in the league, et cetera, et cetera. Speculation, but I, I think it's fair speculation. I think you'll see a bump in 26. Um, the other thing that was speculated yesterday that I, I thought actually made a lot of sense with how some of this has gone back and forth, because another thing that came up was about the media rights sharing and how that has become less of a priority on the player side. I think there's a, a safe assumption that one reason it's become less of a priority is you're not going to see an insane bump in media rights and broadcast rights in this next deal. And we've talked about it from a European perspective, but it's the same thing. I mean, Germany's rights came up. They were reduced in what they brought in by 10%. You know, Businesses in Europe are a little bit different than the, the TV business here, but I don't see an Amazon or like a wild card coming in with a huge offer. Now, there will be some things that will happen ahead of the MLS rights being available that could make it more attractive or maybe less attractive, depending on how it goes. You've got the Premier League rights coming up. That, those negotiations will be starting here very soon. You've got ESPN trying to get La Liga away from being sport. They have a contract, but I guess there's an opportunity to buy it out or however that looks. And ESPN has been linked with a potential buyout there. You're going to have some maneuvering now. And, and that could either create a situation where, say, NBC loses the Premier League. Are they going to want to stay in the soccer business? If they are, if MLS rights are open, maybe they go into it more aggressively to try to steal part of the rights away from a Fox or away from an ESPN even. Maybe not. Maybe if ESPN doesn't get the Premier League, they double down on, on building up MLS. There, there's a lot of maybes and ifs and, and whats. I don't think you see the huge bump in TV rights money. It wouldn't even surprise me if it's flat. And that's fine. In the current environment, that's not a horrible thing. But it's not going to be this windfall for the players to get a share of that. So I think they've backed off of that a little bit. And they're looking for other things. They're giving in other things. The proposal that they've put on the table is absolutely fair. You know, This is what happens with a negotiation. I thought it was reasonable what the league put out to start with. This is a reasonable counter. Okay, you're in the reasonable part of the conversation. Get it done. Get it solved. Move on. 26, at the end of the 26th season, that's a good time to renegotiate a new CBA because you'll know what the effects of the World Cup are. So if things have dramatically changed for the league, all right, the players will, will want a cut of that. If maybe it hasn't been as big as, as people would have hoped, well, maybe there's not as much negotiating room at that point. It's a little bit of a risk on the player's side rather than negotiating in 25 where – you can still say, well, next year is going to be a big year. Next year is going to be a huge year. Now you're going to kind of know the effects of that to a larger degree. But this is where you are in a pandemic where the league's lost a lot of money. No way to avoid it. And it's just it's the reality. So this makes sense. Where they are makes sense, which gives me hope that everybody will be reasonable and get this done. I just don't know what the parameters are now after this deadline and what it means but that's what came out yesterday and we haven't heard from the league yet so we're waiting to hear that um do we have tweets do we have questions do we have comments about mls or anything else we have talked about in our flurry of activity in 36 minutes uh let's see 
Uh, Tafka wanted to know if Atlanta United had been paid in the Pitti Martinez no, no situation. There's no way to know. They will get paid. We just don't know uh, if they have been paid yet or not. Uh, Rich Ransom. I'm tired of the owners still bitter over being defeated over the last CBA and then fighting to get everything back they lost to the players who got the best CBA they've ever had. Oh. And I'm tired of MLS betting the league's future on hoping the 2026 World Cup will bring people to the league. It never works. I don't think someone watches Argentina versus Brazil and then decides they want to watch Cincinnati and Vancouver. Rich, I'll disagree with you on a couple of things. I'll try to try to make sense of this and... Um... This is my opinion on it. Uh, I don't think the... I, I completely disagree with this idea that has been floated out there by the PA and I, I think the media that's friendly to the players because it's most of it. I mean, it's not a mistake that you're getting uh, you know, updates and, and predictions on what this offer from the players could mean almost immediately after it comes out. You know, like, it, it's... The the players have the biggest mouthpiece here in, in American soccer media. They do. The idea that this is an opportunity for the owners to take things back from the players, that's not what they're doing with the proposals. Like, I'm not seeing it. They're not getting a pay cut. They're extending the CBA, which, yeah, you can. It, it, there's definitely concessions there. No doubt. There's a price tag to it. But in my opinion, you can't deny that things have changed. Things changed from February when the CBA was agreed to. A pandemic changed everything. There, I'm sorry, there's no way you can deny that the league is in a different place than it was in February. The renegotiation in June, when the CBA had not been signed yet, to get back on the field and uh, you know uh, adjust based off the pandemic. We were dummies when it came to the pandemic in June. We were stupid when it came to coronavirus and the pandemic's long-term effects in June. Because we didn't think we'd be here right now in June. Not at all. Nobody thought that this was how it would go. I'm sure there were doctors who did. I'm sure there were people who warned it. But from the business perspective, oh, everything was supposed to be better, right? It's not. We still don't know. To be perfectly honest, you know, we still don't know when you're going to have full capacity. I mean... You're getting updates on, on vaccines, and it's good news that they're available, and it's good news that they're making progress. But now you're getting new variants, you know? Like, there's so much unknown that it's just there's no way for us to know this stuff. We were dumb. And these negotiations reflect that we're learning more, in my opinion. I don't think you're trying to take things back. I, I really disagree with that stance, and I don't think it's fair. And I think the player's response, which is really reasonable to the league's proposal, reflects that. It's not saying, no, you're just trying to get things back that you agreed to. It's saying, we agree. Things have changed. The pandemic's had a bigger effect than we all thought it would last June. Now let's figure out how we move forward and, and adjust to that. They should come back to the table again and adjust once we know more about the pandemic. That should be baked into this. But... I think they're on the right track, and I don't think the owners are being horrible people here. I, I just, you lose a billion dollars, you lose a billion dollars, and it affects your business. I, I, I don't like the good guy, bad guy element here. I think finally, after the posturing, and look, Alex Bassin might have been right. The posturing could have created this, and you might have needed the posturing. I don't like it, but it, it absolutely could have got you to this point. The last two proposals... Are, they're all in the reasonable realm. And, and, and Jared, I want to get your take on this. Like, They're all realistic. They all seem to make sense. They're coming from the different sides, of course. One side wants to protect more of this. One side wants to protect more of this. But they're, they're logical right now. And I think it shows that both sides understand that, yeah, this is a realistic discussion that we got to have because of the pandemic. Yeah, this is... it's. It's one of those things where I think the posturing plays into it because that's just the dance that they do when they negotiate every sport. Yeah. It's really annoying to watch. It's really frustrating from the outside. It's like beating your head against a concrete wall. you got to know that they're going to do it. They're going to run things up to the last minute if possible. And I like the player's proposal. Ball's in the league's court yeah. now. I was a little bit surprised they didn't put something, the league didn't put something out last night. But I imagine they're negotiating today. And I think 
everything is in a good spot. Um, I think that what the players put out is fine. Um, yeah. Uh, it's you know, good. I, it's it's yeah. It's I I will completely understand if we get to the next CBA and the players are out for blood to get a lot of to get as much as they can. I think this works out where they I mean they are going to lose some stuff. The owners are going to lose some stuff just because of the nature of the pandemic. But you know, would be would they when they sent it out as you know the players are ready to play. I looked at them like okay, let's go. I mean. I know the owners will probably nitpick some stuff because it's a negotiation and I don't know, it's, it's, it's this standoff thing where people just can't take a, uh, well, this looks good. Let's just take it and get to work. If somebody has to yeah. say something of, well, what if we did this? Because Let me get just the this way over here. Let's go 23 and a half on the free agent yeah. age, you know, yeah, and stuff like and, that. Yeah. And I know the owners will do that. I wish they wouldn't, but I'm fine with what the players put out. And yeah, I'm too. Um, it, hopefully, you know, hopefully the, w- the way they sent that out, Hopefully that leads to we get back to playing sooner rather than later. Or, I mean, I shouldn't say we get back to playing. It's not like we're locked out right now. But hopefully it, it gets settled. So, I mean, good on them for, you know, as we, as we you know, I don't mean it to sound overly simplistic or overly complex, but putting out a proposal, you're like, that's not unreasonable at all. Let's no. go. No, now, yeah. now you're in that. And that, that's where I'm happy they are, John. Like, now you're in that. The first proposal, okay, I understood where the league was coming from. Took a minute of back and forth, but now the the players have responded in a way that makes sense. You understand what's important to them. And they're both realizing the situation that is big losses and and trying to manage it on both sides. Yeah, and one of the things that stuck out to me with what the players put out yesterday was asking for players 23 and higher with four years of service to qualify for free agency 25 and 26. And in 25, way, in 2025, in, 25, in, in 2025 and 2026. Yeah. And I looked at that as basically a continuation of the U22 rule where, say, somebody comes in at, at 18 years old. Then they play those four years all in Major League Soccer. At the age, and when they're out of that U22, then they would be eligible for that free agency element if they stayed in the league all the way through there. So to me, I just thought of that as a continuation of something that mm-hmm. was presented working I, your way through. I don't uh, no, I don't think I don't think they're related at all because you're talking about designated players or essentially designated players and free agency, which are two kind of completely different things. I, I think it's just the the evolution that players have wanted. The last CBA back in fifteen, they wanted free agency and they maybe gave up on other things more than they should to get some form of free agency and you had to be 27 and have eight years of service i mean it was very restrictive now it's coming down to where it's more reasonable this would bring it down even further so you know that that's essentially what the players have said as a trade-off is all right we'll extend the cba by a year if you give us more free agency okay that that's a reasonable trade to make. That's it. I, I don't think the players like the U twenty two initiative. That's why I'm, I'm pushing back on you on it. The the players don't. The, the players hated Tam. They don't like these things that allow the owners to go out and bring players in from outside the league and spend a lot of money. The players association is looking out for the current players, and they feel like that money should go to current players. I think you know, and we've talked about the effects of Tam and and what it's done. I think it improved the league. Um, would I like to see Tam used in more cases on players upgrading in the league? Yeah, I would. I would. And I hope up front offices realize, like maybe what Colorado's doing, is not everybody can go out and spend like in Atlanta or in LA on those players using Tam or using this or using that. It's okay to go get a top player within the league who needs a new home and bring them in and pay them with Tam. That's okay too. And now it's just all part of the, the salary cap. Good. It, it's it's easier to do. It's, it's I think it makes sense. The players got the movement they wanted on that in the last CBA, which was huge for them. And now to get a little more freedom of movement earlier, later in the CBA, again, I think that makes sense, shows what they're looking for, and they're willing to trade off with the owners. I, I think, again, it's it's an understanding from both sides. We're in a different place than we were in June. And in June, we were in a different place than we were in February, and we're adjusting. Yeah, it took posturing. Yeah, it took some bruises to get here. Those bruises need to heal. 
and I hope they do before the next CBA, which the league should be in a really different place. I understand Rich's concern about 26, but it's real. The idea of, and it's not MLS. I, I think, Rich, you're looking at it from a very literal interpretation. No, I don't think people go to see Argentina play in the World Cup and then say, I'm going to go see my local team Cincinnati play directly all that often. It's the business. It's businesses who are investing in sponsorships in soccer around the World Cup because we know what the World Cup can do. I mean, you don't have MLS if you didn't have the 94 World Cup, period. You don't have first division and all the spin-on effects of second division and all the lower divisions that have grown. None of that happens without the 94 World Cup. 26 won't be that because you have an infrastructure already. You're not creating a new infrastructure. But it will have an effect because you'll have businesses that want to sponsor. All right? I mean, play the game that we've all seen, right? Where Coca-Cola is the World Cup sponsor. Well, man, Pepsi wants to piggyback on soccer. Maybe they throw money in at MLS and say, well, we will be sponsoring a soccer product during the World Cup over here and get some, you know, ride those coattails. That's what you see. So I think it will have an effect on the business, not directly as much of what you're, you're thinking, Rich, in terms of that, but that will happen because a World Cup will generate new fans. And if MLS does a good job of doing their own piggybacking, on the World Cup, which they will because of all the soccer, United marketing, U.S. soccer, all those different things. It will, it will have an opportunity to blow the league up to another level. It absolutely will. And the players want to profit from that. And they should. And the league wants to make money from that too. And they should. Because it can take the league to another level, in my opinion. No, I think that what we're looking at from the MLSPA it sounds completely reasonable looking out for your younger players so they can have free agency and they can continue to have, you know, their, their experience reimbursed the way that the players association thinks that it should reduction in the salary cap, because you don't know what the landscape's going to look like financially starting in 2022. That's what the, the players are looking at here. And then reducing the amount of revenue sharing in the next media rights deal to basically one out of eight. If you had eight sections of the pie, the players are looking at just having one of those eight sections, reducing it to 12.5% for 2024. All of these financials seem pretty reasonable when you don't know what the landscape is now, but you're hoping that the league will continue to grow. So when this came across the board yesterday, I have looked at this as like, this stuff is reasonable. So now where does the MLS come in here? Let's get something done and go. Everybody was freaking out about this, and it's, I mean, it's nice, but maybe a little bit of overreaction Friday. Uh, a new Open Cup policy has been approved by the U.S. Soccer Board of Directors. It was kind of quiet because, uh, just general, these kind of things, as you get ready for the AGM, it's kind of quiet behind closed doors. Professional teams in the U.S. Open Cup do not have a limit of five foreign players on their Open Cup rosters. You used to be limited to five international players on your 18 game, 18 player game day lineup no more you just it's your league rules in terms of having players eligible so that will help the professional teams in a big way um, I'm a little surprised they did it but fine you know it is what it is uh, it's good lobbying by the professional teams because it gives them an advantage I think it helped the smaller teams that weren't as reliant on international players but you know, Jarrett, is this something that, from an Open Cup perspective, because we should have Lamar Hunt U.S. Open Cup play back in some form or fashion this year, does it make you more excited? Good Lord willing, and the creek don't rise. Seriously. Yeah, I mean, it, it kind of, yeah, I think it does open up the possibility of um, of some of your professional teams opening up the Death Star on some of the lower division teams. Uh, but it also makes it funnier when it doesn't happen. True. Like when 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 the pro team says we're going to play our entire starting roster for this and we're going to go for this cup. Oh, we still lost to St. Louis. Whoops. <laughs> well, um, not St. Louis funnier. because they're not they're not with us anymore. Sorry. I, yeah, I know, but they made they made a run. <laughs> I, I know, so, but yeah. you, you reference the team that, that's dead and and everybody's sad now, Jared. Fine, Christos FC. God save them. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> And Christos makes a run and scores at the bottom of a berm against DC United yes. in a U.S. Open Cup. Yeah, there and you a go. Bunch of, and a hundred lunatics sitting on a hill lose their minds. Um, yeah, it's it's 
it does benefit the bigger teams. And I will be here curious to see what they do um, with any rule modifications going forward, because this one was kind of weird to me, but that's, it's okay. It's, it's kind of what's expected at this point. There's domestic cups uh, that have this kind of rule around the world. Um, There's a few that do these kind of things that, that kind of limit the, the big team's abilities in, in these tournaments. Rochester wasn't like you weren't going to get another Rochester anytime soon, probably. Probably. Um, just because of the way it's just because the way the schedule is going to break and be it's going to be tough on the lower divisions this year. They're starting later in the year. They're going to probably have some condensed scheduling. Yeah, everyone is. Don't get me wrong, but they're starting later than Major League Soccer is. It's going to be tough for a lower division team to win it anyway. And it's I'm not trying to you know, dismiss any of them. I hope they make a run because it's always fun when you get a lower division team that makes a run in this tournament. Um, and yeah, then Rick, they start playing with house money and they get really terrifying to play against. Ricky Ricardo's yelling at you because the Florida soccer soldiers is the only right answer. What about the, the villages? villages? Yeah. The villages haven't made no, a run. The villages, the the villages, villages get beat and they try to cheat and, and then they get caught and then they, you know, <laughs> the villages don't do anything. It's the Florida soccer soldiers that make the run that everybody should be excited about. Yes. And I'm fine with Yeah, go with it. I mean, uh, the only thing the villages had going for it is that they had that logo that looked like something out of Avatar. Um, the show, not the, not, not blue Pocahontas Avatar, but the actual good show that was on Nickelodeon back in the day. Um, the, the, the rest of it, I, I hope we get more teams making runs. Might be tougher, especially this year. But hopefully, we do get to see them make those runs, and we get a lot of fun with it. Because, like I said, I mean, those teams get terrifying in the later rounds when when they start really playing with house money. Of oh, we have nothing to lose here. We aren't in your eyes. We aren't supposed to be here. So we're just going to kick your teeth in. Then you get you know things like. Uh, soccer soldiers like the teams out west that make the runs like St. Louis a couple years ago, Christos, uh, Charleston Battery have made a final before uh, hell, Charleston played Atlanta United tough in the weirdest game I have ever seen in my life behind closed doors that I thought was going to break at least two reporters emotionally <laughs> Open Cup hero Brandon Vasquez Open Cup hero Brandon Vasquez um, uh, Chris Fairmeister was in the press box that night and when it was two to one at extra time, right before Atlanta scored the third goal to make it three to one, um, Charleston got a shot off and like had an open goal and hit the crossbar and it bounced down and stayed out. And Chris's head was on the desk because I think if that game had gone to penalties, he might have broken completely. <laughs> uh, Welcome to it the was magic just of the cup. Such an exhausting night. That's that's the magic of the cup. Keep scoring goals. Sebastian Soto has gotten his work permit. He will be joining up with Norwich City. I see they don't use the same people Newcastle does for their work permits. That was work visa. Um, I guess it's a different group yeah, of people. And yeah, it is a kind of whatever because I don't think they really cared about DeAndre Yedlin too much. They got it yeah. done, and then now it looks like he is headed off to Turkey. Um, Newcastle's trying to get a replacement so they can let him go now. Who knows if they'll actually answer their calls or emails will go to the spam filter. You know, it's it's what it is. Oh, but then what? Uh, Steve Bruce apparently is getting, uh, what is it, uh, texts and letters that are showing full support for for him and his uh, his efforts at Newcastle? Yeah, Steve Bruce. Uh, sorry, Alex Pacine, if you're listening. I apologize. Um, when you're down to... The only thing you have to say at this point when people say, uh, yeah, things aren't going very well, are they? Well, I have a lot of people who are sending me messages of support through various means. I'm getting them via text. I'm getting letters. I'm getting postcards. I had a carrier pigeon show up the other day. Um, I had a singing telegram. I mean, when that's all you have to answer, (laughs) I think it's time to go. Oh, I really think God. it's time to just go and, and and leave Newcastle alone because you don't have anything else to say. I mean, now I'm actually curious. What is the next response when they lose again and and don't look great in doing it? And you have questions about, hey, uh, Steve, when you guys actually tried to play the game that is known as soccer, you looked okay at it. Why don't you do that more often? 
well, you know, we're we're a very low team in the league, and we're not very good, and we we have to be very safe to try to stay up, and yeah. blah blah blah. Yeah. We're we're looking at things and lining up our individual game plans with our opponents on a on a game by game basis, and sometimes the game plan dictates that we have to play one way. Sometimes it dictates that we have. Did he to play actually another say way. this, or are you making this up? I'm making this up. Okay, because that didn't make any sense, so now I understand it. It wouldn't have yeah, made no. sense if it was Steve Bruce either. So you know, right. I mean, that's why I'm I'm getting clarification. Um, no, there's no change in the game plans. The only reason they came out and played against Leeds is because Leeds makes you because of the way they play. Like uh-huh. if if you want to survive, you should probably try to take advantage of the space that Leeds is going to leave you because they're going to play in a very open way and say this is what we do. You know, Newcastle took advantage of that and they looked like a real team. Like a real team. But that was probably very scary for Steve Bruce. It, yes. it looked like he was worried when they scored. Because he'd probably never seen attacking soccer like that since 1996 when he played for Manchester United. And they had players who actually attacked. Yeah, I know, it's a, it's a little overwhelming. But he's got the letters, he's got the, 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 the notes from the carrier pigeons. Uh, maybe he, he caught the singing telegram on his uh, flip phone and was able to record that. Uh, maybe there's maybe he a... he shows up with a dog next time. Yeah, maybe he shows up with a dog Support next time. Support animal? He might need one. Um, it's very bad for Steve Bruce, and I'm very sorry for Newcastle fans like Alex Bassine and others who have to suffer through this. So much more, so much, more, on so a much better basis and stuff. Um, Jarrett, I think you're about to leave us, correct? Jarrett left us, yes. No, oh, he already left us. Well, then, never mind. He I was going to actually say something to Jarrett, but he just dipped. See how it is. Um, he knew it was time, and he was trying to leave you room because uh, Mike Conti will be joining us in a couple of minutes, and. Jarrett wanted to leave you proper spacing for your big moment, John. I believe uh, Chiefs coach Steve has laminated scorecards ready for this. Oh, wow. He's moved Complete up. With dry erase marker and ready to go? Yes. He's all ready to go. Um, maybe somebody is using a chalkboard. Steve Bruce is probably there with like a, a concrete slab and a rock to uh, mark his points down. We'll, we'll see how he does and what he gives you. As you tell us about our good friend, Steve Apolinski. Apolinski and Associates, LLC, proud supporters of everything soccer down here in the SDH network for wrongful death and serious injury matters. There's one phone call, one kind of communication that you need to make in one direction only, and it is to Apolinski and Associates, LLC. A couple different ways that you can do it. You can get a free consultation by giving Steve a call. Area code 404-377-9191. You can shoot Steve an email directly, steve at aa-legal.com. Or you can go on the World Wide Web. Large device or small, you type in aa-legal.com. You hit the enter key, the return key, the arrow key, whatever advances it to the home page. And when the home page of Apple & Associates LLC pops up, so does a pop-up window in the right-hand corner because that's what pop-up windows do. They pop up 24-7, 365 and a quarter. Thank you, Chris Hutchison. And you can have your questions answered right there and then inside the pop-up window with the individual or individuals that are on the other side. So it's phone, it's email, it's web. For your questions on wrongful death and serious injury matters with Apolinsky and Associates, LLC, recognized as legal elite by Georgia Trend Magazine for being one of the top 100 firms in this here state of Georgia. They have over 30 years of experience, over $40 million in judgments for their clients in Georgia and Alabama. Wrongful death and serious injury matters, all you need to do. Catch up with Steve Apolinsky, Apolinsky and Associates, LLC. The website is aa-legal. Dot com. You ran really long that time. Well, everybody's sitting there kvetching about me going incredibly short, so I, I figured I, I'd go John, ahead and try I, to go long. I do not understand your brain sometimes. You've been getting the best scores of your life on your reads, and you consider that kvetching. Hmm, okay. I don't understand, but anyway, I, I've tried not to, so I don't you get should, headaches. You're the one yelling at me. Oh, that's the shortest one you've ever done. You know, I'm trying to drink a Red Bull here. here. I'm just telling you the timing. I'm just telling you. I'm giving you the scores, and they're good. I don't think that's kvetching. I'm just saying. And I don't, I don't think that it's – the. Sh- I don't, it doesn't feel short, and that one didn't feel long. I mean, at the end, I was I waiting the for the baseline to sit there and go before I could do the dot .com because there's a certain no, element not, in that, the riff that's not the that I wait part of it. for. That's not the length part of it. It, it. it was about 15 seconds longer than you've typically been running this week. 
So it was about a minute and a half? Uh, yeah. Okay. All right, scores before uh, Mateo dials up Mike Conti. Uh, finger counting minus one. Actually, that um, was uh, pain. Okay. Uh, Ragamuffin says a pop-up window does actually pop up. Just checked. 9.5 for telling the truth. Uh, <laughs> 1 plus 1 plus 2 plus 1 plus 0.5 plus 3. Which eight is and what? 8.5 from, from Domer. I don't know Domer's categories. I'm intrigued. Uh, yeah. 9, 9.5. This was impressive. Uh, dang, son, you're growing up top to be a radio guy. 8.8. Who gave me? Who gave me the dang son? That was Chiefs coach Steve. Chiefs uh, coach Steve. Minus one, uh, but no score yet. Uh, oh, minus two plus the minus one uh, seven from four card. Uh, okay. Nine point five seven five, eight point five. Um, spicy like- accent on saying injuries plus one uh, plus one off script, but didn't mess it up. Minus one timing on the end eight. Okay. 7.6. Uh, lost a point for length. Lost a point for off script. Overall good read. Uh, somebody needs to give you a hug, according to Chiefs coach Steve. Uh, Mizano gave you a red card. Four card told you to calm down. I think that's after when you were worried about kvetching. Uh, 8.75. Decent pacing. Good mood. Uh, Feels points- like I'm not sticking the landing, though, if I'm getting an 8.75. Points off for saying area code because it was superfluous, according to Katie. Um, four card does not like your aggression. Uh, 8.2 dropped to 6.1. No need to yell at me. See, now you're bullying me, John. What's up with this? What's up with this? Uh, you're a bad winner. Cappuccino with a shot of Kahlua out of 10. Oh, wow. That's sounds pretty strong. That sounds pretty good, actually. Not gonna lie. Um, you need some smoked herring, a lightly toasted sesame bagel, and a cardigan, according to Alex Pacine. I am not a smoked herring person. Uh, I'm not surprised. Uh, Joe, uh, you're getting a little defensive, he says, uh, to you, and it's very Big Sam-like. Hey, at least I'm not sitting here talking about gravy and playing a de- and reading a defensive promo. I don't think Big Sam's actually talked about gravy. I think that might be a, a suggestion. Um, four out of ten. <laughs> Too many computer instructions. I'm trying to hire a lawyer, not learn Linux. <laughs> Awesome. Okay, I think we have uh, things happening, and we're going to get Mike Conti on the line. So Mateo is going to get Mike, and we might have Bombas, and we might have things. And you guys throw fake Bombas at me sometimes, so Bombas need to be checked. But let's see if we can get Mike on Z-Line. He's like, man, where were these guys? What's up, Mike? How are you? Maybe. I believe Mike Conti is with us, but I don't think we are hearing Mike. If Mike is hearing me, we will figure this out. Actually, Mateo will figure it out because he's very good. Come at on, Mateo. What's going on? We are Yay! efforting. We see Mike, and we, you guys will see him in just a second. Mike, do you hear us? <laughs> Mike does not hear us. Interesting. So we will we will give you Mike in just a second when uh, he is communicating with us. Um, I don't know what's going on. Okay, we're going to try to get Mike back on here in just a second. This is very strange. Um, he is working. This, this is this is not Mateo. Do not blame Mateo. This is not on Mateo. Um, this is uh, on Mike's virtual producer <laughs> working on this. We got to figure out who Mike's virtual producer is, and whoever that is, they're hanging under the big mean cloud of Bruce Benedict today. I think. Yeah, probably. Um, okay, we will we will keep efforting. So uh, stay tuned to <laughs> as all of this turns. Um, yes, because this is what this is what happens sometimes. It's all good. Um, I believe we had fake bombas. We're, we're getting fake bombas and things. It's craziness. It's madness. It's all kinds of shenanigans. Fake it's, bombas it's a Friday. again. Probably. Um, yes, su- superfluous. Sorry. Sorry, John Nason. My pronunciation was crappy. I apologize. Um, minus one for me. That's fine. You can give me a yellow card. Um, okay. While we're trying to get Mike, we will update you on a couple of other things that are on the board because there's a bunch of things. 
Uh, U.S. soccer financials are out and they're not pretty, which is not a surprise. We're in the midst of a pandemic. Uh, projected deficit for fiscal year 2021 is $44 million. That's not good um, because they had no money come in from games. They had no money come in from national team games. The big reserve that U.S. soccer had after the Copa America um, Centenario in 2016 of over a hundred million or so, it's going to be down a lot and down to about 30 million when all this is said and done. And that's projected. It could get worse. We'll have to see. Um, this is going to affect a few things with the Federation. They do have a reserve, but it's dipped a lot, even with cuts. Again, no surprise. I think we have Mike now. Guys, sorry. That, that was weird. I, I, couldn't hear you. I could hear myself, but I couldn't hear you. Huh. Very weird. Very, very strange. Um, well, now that you're with us, I will bring you on the screen so everybody can see you here in just mm-hmm. a sec. You don't have to. I was just... Uh... Oh, no. No, no. Oh, I've, no. Been, I've been troubleshooting this camera thing because stoppage time on Wednesday was an absolute mess. So I downloaded the Skype app onto my computer thinking that would make the camera better. But in doing that, I somehow made it impossible for me to hear you guys it changes the settings but once you get it it should be better yeah i'll uh i'll just have to troubleshoot yeah once 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 you get it that's definitely the way to go like i had to go down that road too when i first started doing this is the you have to go to the microsoft website and download skype there because for some reason it's different than Mm. the one that just automatically shows up um it's strange but it's true It, it definitely allowed me to do this kind of stuff, and everything was working better once I figured it out. So we'll sort it out. Yeah. So are we doing CBA down here this morning? Or we have, have been? we have. Um, I mean, I thought the players' response and their counter proposal made sense. I, I think we saw what they valued, and I think we saw that they understood. Yeah, there's been losses. We, we're going to have to to give a little bit. We're going to have to work together here. The trade-off of some earlier free agency for players towards the end of the CBA for not two years of an extended CBA, but one more year, I, I think we're in the ballpark. I, I yeah, think. I, I agree. I mean, it, concessions are being made. So obviously there, there's a productive good faith dialogue going on. I think the fact that we haven't heard anything publicly since all that came out yesterday is a really good sign. Uh, yeah. Probably means that both sides are talking or proposals are being exchanged. Um, you know, when we last spoke on Wednesday, I said, you know, the, the league needs to be very judicious in not threatening a lockout. I thought that was an extremely unnecessary and unfortunate thing that they did on Thursday. Um, and, and I think you guys know that that I've been on the side of both sides need to hammer this out and acknowledge that we had a really bad 2020 economically, and it's not going to be a lot better in 2021 and both sides need to give. So I think I've been very, very clear on that. I thought the league threatening lockout uh, was a completely unnecessary. Well, I, I'll give the, I'll give the league the benefit of the doubt on this. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you why, because they didn't actually threaten it. It was reported that they had shared a memo with their front offices about be prepared if it happens. Because the league didn't comment on it. I'd assume the MLSPA did the same thing. Just, you know, I'd assume that. Now, did they leak the limo? Of course, we can. John, go get your tinfoil hat. How did the memo get to Jeff Carter? I I don't know. Go get your tinfoil hat, John. You need to go put it on now because that's where. No, no, no. no. This isn't tinfoil (laughs) hat. Come on. I know. I'm kidding. Tinfoil hat. Who Someone knows? leaked it to Jeff Carlisle. That's right. how, it, Jeff Carlisle's not on some league email listserv that goes to all 27 clubs. But what Come I'm on. saying is maybe the league office didn't leak it, but maybe somebody at a team did, and it wasn't yeah, intended far, to go out that way. As far as I'm concerned, that's one and the same. Okay. Uh, it, it was an unnecessary uh, escalation because, like we've been talking about, exercising force majeure and opening up this 30-day window does not automatically mean, and it was pointed out by Jeff Carlisle, we've been saying it repeatedly, it doesn't automatically mean the CBA is terminated. Right. So if you're sending out a memo to the clubs and, oh, by the way, that memo accidentally 
drops into the hands of ESPN, come on, it, 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 that's a threat. to the. And, and you're probably right. The players probably have been having internal chatter about how to deal with a lockout. Yeah, they've well. had to. Um, you know, th- this is not quite as dramatic as it was over the summer. Right. Where there was a publicly stated, I think, 72-hour deadline. I mean, we're not there. Yeah, that was uh, the main but, thing I wanted to, to make clear was it was a little at, different. No, it, it's not like that. I, I still think we're going to get this done. I, I mean, like you said, Jason, I, I think there's an acknowledgement now by both sides that, um, you know, there needs to be some concessions on both sides. I, I think it's a big concession by the players to offer a one-year extension of the CBA. Uh, and it, honestly, I think now it does put a little bit of pressure on the league because, um, you know, the, I think the league is correct when they say that they're going to have two years of substantial losses at least. 2020 was one of them. Look, we're going to have substantial losses in 2021. I, I just don't see any realistic scenario where you're going to have 100% full capacity stadiums by April or even by July. I just don't see that as I'm being realistic. So how, how do we now deal with this issue of the second year extension of the CBA? Are the owners going to be really, really dug in on that? Because they are correct. They're going to they're gonna get hit again this year. Uh, are the players going to be dug in on one year? Because obviously 2026, not coincidentally, is the year of the World Cup in the United States. And... Um, you know, the league obviously stands to, to benefit tremendously financially from that. Uh, are there ways where the owners can cover themselves somewhat for what could likely happen this year in terms of losses in a way that would be acceptable to the players? And I think the longer that we don't hear anything on social media from both sides, the greater the chance is that both sides are really engaged in a productive discussion in trying to work that issue out because it seems to me now that that's pretty much what it comes down to. You know, in 2020, when Major League Soccer had a season in its various forms, it was about the league losing less. I know that's a relative term, but it's about losing less money than not doing anything because of all the TV contracts and all the other commitments that you'd have to make financially. This year, coming up, it's going to be the same where you're going to be still losing money, but you're still putting a product out there because I think the league understands, and obviously the Players Association does as well, where Major League Soccer is in the landscape of North American sports and the footprint. You're right there at the edge of that big four in some conversations. You are a part of the big four. And what you don't want to do is take all of this growth that you've had over the last handful of years with all of these media partners, all of these contracts, all the growth of the league itself, and then just flush it down the toilet and go back to where you were five, ten years ago and have to rebuild all of that. I think that you have an important place for Major League Soccer that has to be maintained so you can continue to grow in the world theater So 2021 had to happen, and you had to get everything squared away, and hopefully they're on that path. Yeah, and I I hope, I I certainly think, and I hope that both sides are aware of that. I mean, there's just way, way too much to lose, uh, even with a a short-term work stoppage. Uh, And and even, look, training camps aren't going to open for another month, but if you're to call a lockout over this weekend or going into next week, it's a tremendous amount of embarrassment and negative press for the league that can be absolutely avoided, which is another reason why I thought it was a tad bit unnecessary for that memo to even go out. In, in reality, what would even be the point of locking out players when training camps haven't even opened anyway? Right. It, it, it's, it's, um, it's bluster. And I just thought it, it was not... If you're if you're trying to carry out a good faith negotiation, uh, it's an unnecessary addition to that. So the look, the league I, I think would suffer tremendously bad press and embarrassment, even if there was a 24 hour to 48 hour lockout. It's something that the league I'm sure wants to avoid because of that. And obviously the players, you know, they want to keep getting paid through the off season, so they're going to want to avoid that too. Yeah, it's the kind of thing like. 
Right, and, and Ragamuffin points it out on the Twitch pitch. Like MLS doesn't get the coverage that they deserve at times, but this is Absolutely. the kind of thing that people would jump on. Like, oh, yep. yeah, we we talk bad about MLS when we have their highlights on after their game just ended on SportsCenter. Ooh, something negative about MLS? We're in. This is going to be exciting. Yeah. And they okay, would by the, way, that. by the way, that also includes American soccer media. Uh, yeah, that's uh, absolutely true. It's not just the, yeah. the mainstream media. It, it is. Um, I hope, and, and as, as people have pointed out, like, I hate the bluster. I hate the posturing. I hate that stuff because I think it, it clouds the whole discussion of everything, but it seems like both sides bluster and, and all that did get to a point where, all right, they're talking reasonably and they're sharing reasonable proposals. I wish they could have done that on their own, but they did meet the urgency that, yeah. you know, you kind of needed from the time. I hope we have some good news today. I just can't see them being that far apart with what we know at this no. point. No, I, I can't either. But it does take time to go through proposals and counter proposals and roll up legal language and all of that. So, like, it's not like I'm watching the clock right now and expecting something at any minute. I, I think these things do take time. Yeah. Again, the longer you go without hearing from one or both of the sides, I think the better. Um, and I, look, I, I think the players need to be applauded for making a big concession. Absolutely do. Yeah. That, that's, a, that's a big concession. They need to be applauded for that. Uh, but I, I think we also need to continue to understand that major league soccer is a business, not a charity. And that, you know, there needs to be some realism about the, I mean, I, I heard you guys talking before I was able to figure out how to turn on my microphone. Um, you, you know, all over the globe, this has become a, a fight for survival, almost, to keep to keep professional soccer in business. It's not a charity. So, you know, uh, uh, as much as I'm applauding the players for making that concession, I, I just want to remind people that there's a reason why the league asked for what they asked for. It wasn't to be spiteful or greedy, or punitive. I mean, come on. Let's look at some of the owners we know in this league. Would anyone call Arthur Blank greedy or spiteful? No. As he writes a $1 billion check to build a children's hospital in Brookhaven? No. Come on. No. You know, so I can't speak for every owner in this league, but I think we've had enough experiences with a lot of owners in this league that they're not in this to be punitive. They're in this to keep themselves able to pay their staff, and pay their players. That's what it comes down to. Um, so I hope it gets worked out. I, I, and I've been optimistic the whole time that, that it probably will get worked out, hopefully sooner rather than later. But, um, you know, that, that it, I'm sick and tired of talking about this. <laughs> yeah, let's yeah. let's I mean, stop. Uh, let, had, let's yeah, do that. We've had to do this three times in the last two years. Yeah. Last year, really. Yeah. I'm over. I, I just I don't want to have to do it anymore. And honestly, I think, the reason why the players have been as deliberate through this process as they have is because they feel some kind of way about the fact that they've been asked to go to the table now for a third time in the last year. I get it. Yeah. But you couldn't have predicted the pandemic and you could not have predicted the economic fallout uh, lasting as long as it has and as long as it will continue to go. There's so much that has changed since they agreed to a CBA before the start of the, the 2020 season. It right. that feels like 10 years ago. <laughs> it's insane. Uh, let's get into a couple of things about the on the field side of it. Uh, we have the I, we have the pots for CONCACAF Champions League. We know how it's going to go down. Uh, we know Atlanta United's in pot one along with the other American teams, the Canadian team, either Forge FC or Toronto when they have their Canadian championship cup final the winner of that will go into pot one most of the mexican teams monterey club america cruz azul leon is the one who gets bumped into pot two again they, they were last time as well and they're obviously the one you don't want to draw out of pot yeah. two saprisa yeah. alawalense from costa rica are both difficult they're top teams in in the the central american region I don't want to see Olympia after we saw what they did in this tournament, knocking Seattle out. I'd take my chances with Marathon from Honduras as opposed to Olympia. The other three, and there's three much smaller teams than we're used to seeing here with Real Esteli, with Arcai from Haiti, 
um, and Atletico Pantoja from the Dominican Republic. You'd love to see any of them in the first week of your season and, and have a home and away with them and be able to manage that. Th- those are the ones you're hoping for. You have a one in five chance of seeing Leon, right? Because they cannot play a Mexican right. team in the first round. Right. So you have a one in five chance at Leon, whereas you have a one in eight chance against everyone else, just for what it's worth. Yeah. And you're right. That's you, important. you don't want to see Leon. You, I would not want any part of a fixture at the Monsters Cave uh, in the first round. I think that could be very. Now, if you don't have fans, maybe it becomes a little more manageable. I mean, that that's a huge. That after. definitely helps you. It, it, against the Prius, it, it would. Yeah, yeah I, Alo Alonso yeah, too. But Costa Rica is a tough yeah. place to go in and get results. We've seen it yeah. <laughs> years yeah. ago. It, it is not easy at all. Um, so it, it's going to be interesting. I, I like it because it gives us something to look forward to. Yes. Uh, and the draw is going to be what the Wednesday after the Super Bowl. I mean, it's coming up pretty soon. Yeah, February tenth. Uh, it'll be at seven o'clock. It'll be on TV. Uh, I'm sure we'll be doing a watch party for that. It'll absolutely. be silliness. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think Atlanta United has. I don't think they've been overly lucky or overly unlucky with their draws in the last two years. Uh, Ariano obviously was a tough draw, but not the toughest that they could have had in 2019. Uh, Matagua was probably on the semi more reasonable end of how it could have gone last year. So uh, bad luck with you know, where you got grouped in the bracket with. Yes, that- with true. with Monterey and Club America. That's absolutely true. But I think, I mean, you would need incredibly good luck yeah. to not be uh, bracketed with, um, you know, one of the top teams from Mexico. You, that would require a really good luck. So we'll have to see. I, I, I think it would be fun just from a geographic standpoint to maybe check another country off the bucket list for Atlanta United. You know, if they were to go to Haiti, if they were to go to the Dominican Republic, um, that that would be kind of interesting just from a geographical standpoint. I mean, if you think about the countries that Atlanta United has played in, obviously the U.S., Canada, and Mexico, but they, they've played in Costa Rica, they've played in Honduras. Might be fun just from an international competition standpoint to check off one more of the boxes, but um, we'll see. I mean, it. Leon and Saprees are the two teams I don't want to see. Anyone else, I think, hopefully they would be able to handle. Yeah, and then you look at pot one and, you know, to, to be able to see a Columbus crew in there, to see a Philadelphia Union in there, to see a Portland in there. You know, we talk about the variety of places in pot two where Atlanta United, where we'd like to see Atlanta United go. Then you add the, the flavor of the incoming teams from MLS, too, and I think that that's also part of the coolness factor of it to see how things line up for the new guys coming in from Major League Soccer, too. Yeah, absolutely. Philadelphia hasn't been in it in a long time, I think. Yeah. Um, and I think it's been a minute for Portland as well, if at all, right? Uh, uh, it's been a minute. I mean, no, they were the there. The was a yeah. cup champion, but uh, and that's been a few years. Uh, for that matter, it's been a minute for Columbus. So, it, yeah, that'll be fun. It, it'll be a fun experience. I, I'm sure some of the Philadelphia front office people who were around the last time they were in it, which I think was, oh, boy, 2011, 2012. It was a long time ago. They're they're probably thinking, okay, good. We don't have a group stage. <laughs> we'll take that. We, we don't have to you know, fly over North and Central America for a whole month. Uh, it, it's going to be a lot of fun. I think it's going to be a fun tournament. I think there's a lot of mystery to this tournament, and there's a lot that we still don't know about all the teams that are going to be in it. Because I think all 16, te- 17, really, if you uh, if you want to, you know, count the two Canadian teams, one of which will advance, uh, all of them have got business to conduct and moves to make and teams to form over the next ten weeks. Uh, and in some cases, some of these clubs are dormant right now. They aren't even in their training camp. So we got a long way to go, long way to handicap this. But I'm, I love this tournament. I'm really looking forward to it again. Atlanta United did get a gift to get mm-hmm. in it, but uh, take advantage of it. You know, it, Atlanta United has played in, extremely respectably in this tournament the last two years. Now they want to take the next step. You know, you don't want to have moral victories anymore with the – a second leg win against Club America or Monterey when you're already down 3-0. You, you want to take the next step now. 
get to the semifinals, potentially get into a single leg final where anything can happen. Um, and, and, you know, establish yourself as one of the best, if not the best clubs on this continent. They're going to have a chance to do that. Now, what if, what if I told you, Mike, that you get a, a draw in the first round, you get through that. Uh, let's say it's uh, Real Esteli. You, you, you survive it, you go through. It's Club America again in the uh, quarterfinals. And who's lining up on the other side in a number 10 shirt? <laughs> Pitti Martinez. Yeah, I, what's this? I, I guess the delayed payments. Are, uh, no, he's not uh, getting paid. <laughs> like, there's a bunch of yeah. people just Apparently not getting the paid. the suitcases that they trotted out in the promo video that might have been, like Jason was saying, it might have just been the hundreds on the top and a, like a bunch of soap underneath it. It was Monopoly money underneath it. <laughs> help me out with this, guys. Help me out with this. I, I really want to understand this because I, I have not taken my brain pills yet this morning. So I, I just want to help me out. Because I have not seen that report. He's being linked to Club America? He's not being linked directly to Club America yet. He's being linked with a move to Mexico. I okay. don't think there's another club that could pay him. You know, he was making reportedly from the, the MLSPA uh, around a million here. Uh, the reports when he went to Saudi Arabia was that would be bumped up to, I believe it was three and a half was, was what had been reported. It was a huge raise. So, I mean, maybe your Monterey or your Tigres could All right. potentially, even if it's Monterey or Tigres. Yeah, if it's one of those big three, it's got to be a big club. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's just wow. I mean, that's kind of interesting considering that a lot of the American soccer observers thought that Pitti Martinez was uh, a. What was the word? Oh, yes, a bust yeah, in bust. MLS. An $18 yet, million dollar bust. Yes, and, and yet at the Allegedly. same time, one of those big clubs in Mexico could be getting in on him. But they don't I, know I, what I, they're I, doing I, either. I wonder if they're seeing something differently that maybe we did not. Uh, well, we are all in agreement about pit team, but I'm wondering if maybe those big established clubs in Mexico with very smart people running them may have seen something that others up here in the United States did not. It's very, very strange to me. Very odd. <laughs> just it just drives me nuts. Like, it, you know, oh, this guy's a, and it's not just a pity. I mean, it's a, it's player X, Y, and Z. We, we hear this conversation all the time. Oh, he can't play. He can't. This, this was a poor investment. This is a waste of money. He came here and failed. Blah, blah, blah. And yet, a lot of those players, and it's not just Pitti Martinez, end up moving on to more established clubs, in many cases for more money, and they go there and thrive. It's just, it's it's remarkable to me how, and we talk about this after matches sometimes, how two people can watch something and have such wildly different conclusions. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, it's well, okay. I mean, look, the, the debate is... We, you guys couldn't do a two-hour podcast every morning if there wasn't anything to debate, right? Like that's, the that's debate's true. good, and, and I, I, let me be clear: like just I embrace it. Yes. Yeah. Right. No, I welcome debate. And I welcome the conversation. I just want it to be fair. Yes. I think in a lot of cases it was not fair when it came to Pitti Martinez, yeah, nope. and it has not been fair when it comes to Ezekiel Barco. That's all I ask for. I mean, we, we can have a dialogue, and we can talk about it. We can point out their strengths and their weaknesses, but you've got to be fair. You, know, you can't just assume that because he had a certain price tag and he won a certain award before he came to MLS that he's got to score 20 goals a year. That's not what he was brought in here to do. He was brought in here to create chances, and he certainly did that. He averaged a goal or an assist per match. Uh, he stepped up in... Big moments. They would not have won the U.S. Open Cup without him in 2019. Um, so it's just, I, I don't mind people disagreeing with us on this, but I, I, I just want the totality of their contribution to be considered and not just pick out all the negatives and ignore all the positives. I totally agree. Uh, yeah, Jason, before Mike goes, I want to exercise a moment of parliamentary procedure on a non-soccer topic, so I want to reserve that before Mike goes. Uh-oh. Okay, we'll see where that could go. Um, one more for you, Mike. This is coming out this morning in England. The Premier League is going to join the FIFA and IFAB trial on concussion substitutes. 
Yes. Now, this was approved, and there's a few different ways that people can do it, and there's going to be two different ways that are they're going to come up in the next few months. The Club World Cup is going to use it. They're going to limit it to one concussion substitution per match. The Premier League is doing a different one, up to two permanent concussion substitutes. So you get bonus substitutions, essentially, up to two. And if a change is made, the opposing team can make a substitution at that same time. So you can't game the system by saying, oh, yes, he's a concussion risk. We need to substitute him. We need a bonus substitution, and the other team doesn't get one. So I, I get their thought process on that. Is this something, in some form or fashion, that you want to see MLS do for the 21 season? Well, yes, a uh, 100%. It's long overdue. Yeah. What was the game up in New England in 2019? I think Eric uh, Rometty got concussed, got sent by, back in by the, the venue doctor, clearly was unable to play. I mean, there, there was a... See, that one was... Yeah, but that one was tough, and I'll actually give everybody the benefit of the doubt because, I mean, you know me. Like, whenever there's a, a head injury, I'm paying a lot of attention to it because I, I went through it myself, so I'm really sensitive to it. I was fooled in that one because, I mean, he was down. We got a good look at the contact. I, I want to say it was like a forearm to the back of the head. Um, Should have been a card, and it wasn't. But... Mm-hmm. After he was down and he got up and came back in, I, I think I said it on the commentary. Like, he's moving around okay. He looks like he's all right. We'll have to keep an eye on him, but he looks like he's okay. And then behind the play, five, ten minutes later, he went down again. And, and that's the challenge without any kind of concussion substitution rule. Like, you don't know. You want to see if he's okay. He's passing whatever test they're using, which they probably need better ones. And you put him back out. Now, yeah. and I was not a fan of this until some of the reporting came out about it and some of the studies came out. I, if I remember correctly, with the the IFAB or FIFA study that they cited to go to permanent substitutions, not temporary like I had proposed, the, the study showed that 15% of players who went back in after any kind of a 10-minute a or whatever pause were concussed, and they, they didn't catch it. If it's one person, if it's one player, they, they need to prevent that. So I'm, I'm good. I've, I'm bought in on the, the permanent one. Um, I'm with you. they got to do it. Do, do, you know, on the format, do you... I kind of want to see what they do, and I don't know if MLS needs to make this decision yet. Should it be one? Should it be two? Should the other team get the substitutions to go along with it? I guess there's conversation about who makes the decision on if they qualify, if it's an independent person or what. Yeah. I mean, you've got a lot of things to figure out, but I hope MLS is at the forefront of this in 21. Yeah. Now, it, it, look, from a player safety standpoint, you've got to protect your investment in your players. This is a way to do it. Yeah. Um, it it's in the best interest of player safety. It's in the best interest of the game. Um, you know, I, I, I'm going to have to take more time to think about should the opposing team get a corresponding bonus sub. Um, I would hate to think that there would be an incentive uh, late in a match if, if all substitutions are exhausted. Where... Have, have you seen the second division in Argentina, Mike? Well, yeah, no. I, I mean, it's kind of funny, but it's kind of not. Like, I know. If you're out of subs and you need to get a fourth guy in, or yeah. I mean, wherever we're at. Are we going to see somebody run into the post right. and, and say, yeah. oh, yeah, I, no. I, yeah, I whiplash. Yeah. Honestly, that is, that is something that I could see trying to be gamed somewhere in the world. I so know we could. I that, know. that aspect of the law might need to be fine too. There's obviously an expense that would come into play as well if you yeah. need to have uh, neutral doctors all over the world. I mean, it's not Good a big point. deal for MLS, but like in USL League One, yeah. For example, yeah, uh, you know that's an expense. Are, are you yeah. going to pay a doctor five hundred dollars an hour to be at your game and clear guys who might be concussed, uh, or do you leave it to the athletic trainers and you put it on more of an honor system? I mean, those are things that I think the individual leagues yeah. are going to have to work it's out. It's hard when when issue. you do these laws too, because you know FIFA and IFAB are thinking not just about major leagues; they're thinking about your your local amateur yep. league. You know, I mean yep. we. We had a situation with this in, in NPSL, which, you know, you don't normally, a few teams did, but most teams didn't travel with a trainer. 
the home team would provide a trainer. And that's typical in, in school sports too. And uh, we had a situation where a player um, was uh, head injury and was cut and th- it stopped the bleeding, did everything with that. But the home team trainer would not allow the player to go back into the game. And it created a huge argument and a huge debate because it's, how are you telling us how we can't use our player and blah, blah, blah. And you've got to create a law that manages that along with the independent doctor. That's what's so hard about it. It is. But again, in the best interest of player safety, MLS has got to implement this in some form in 2021. And, and look, you're going to get a little bit of a beta test in the Premier League, I guess. So maybe yeah. as it evolves over there, you'll be able to benchmark some aspects of it. But yeah. we've seen it too many times. We've seen too many times guys play when they should not because you don't want to put that substitution in jeopardy. And, and I'm glad that IFAB and FIFA have taken this step. Now MLS needs to do so. Yeah. Corresponding. Yeah, they need to announce it today. Uh, as soon as they yeah, can say, early. We, there's we, no need to delay. Yeah, yeah we're, no we're going to figure delay. out what we do. We're going to figure out the exact parameters of it. We'll announce that you know the, before the season starts, but we will be taking part in the trial. They need to announce yeah. that. No, I, I like the idea of the two and uh, trying to figure out ways so you're not gaming the system on the other side because I would rather err on the side of more and not need it. Well, and, honestly, yeah, John, not to interrupt, I'd be fine no. if it were unlimited. Yeah, I, I'd be fine if it were. I mean, you very seldom see more than two concussions aside per game, right? But what if it does happen? Yeah, it, I, I mean, again, if it's in the best interest of safety, I'm fine with it being unlimited. Mm-hmm. I'm fine with expanding rosters accordingly as well. Like, if you want to go from an 18 to a 20, and and that that gives you a little bit of wiggle room now with concussion related substitutions, I'm fine with that as well. You know, yeah. it's all about player safety. It's not about gaining a competitive advantage. Yeah, no, I'm with you. I think that I would rather have the chance to have more options if something were to happen than instead of being you know, stuck with, oh, you can only do one, and then the game ends up, you know, with 10 or 9 or however many if you take it down that road. I would rather have more and work my way backward than less and be stuck needing yeah. more. It's how I would do it. I would phrase totally it. agree. I'm with you, John. All right, what do you have, John? All right, so, Mike, the uh, Southeastern Conference uh, announced its uh, composite football schedule for 2021. I already know where this is going. Oh, boy. Yeah, so, yeah, well, no, and that's the thing. It's like once this particular matchup that you and I have been talking about right. was on the board and we knew it was going to happen, I'm already getting questions from the boss about Auburn and Penn State on September 18th in State College. And so we're already looking at hotels, already looking at flights, trying to figure out the best approach to get in because right now there are hotel rooms that are already at $600 plus a night in State yeah, that, College. That's a good rate for State College on a football weekend, by okay. the way. Okay. <laughs> so, so then uh, basically I, I'm asking you as our college football Rick Steves. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> or Fedor, or whoever you want to do it. Yeah. Uh, obviously, A, I know that uh, our attendance is, is locked into the notion of if there's something that can be arranged when it comes to the MLS schedule. But helpful hints to make sure that this game can be attended. Is it flying into Pittsburgh, flying into Harrisburg, flying into State College? What? Great questions, John. Uh, so first of all, uh, if it works out with our schedules, we're going. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I really look forward to to going to the Plains in, in 2022. And what or, or, well, I don't know if there's a year off in between or not. I, I can't remember when the return game is, but uh, we're going. Even if there's an MLS game that weekend, I think we might still go. Jason yeah. might end up doing play by play that weekend. <laughs> <laughs> I can do this. That, that, uh, hey, I, I've the, left you solo before, so I mean, it's only well, fair, right? Well, well, you didn't leave me solo. You you uh, you had. You had, you had well, to, I, I left you with an usher in Columbus. <laughs> no, you had more important things to do. You know, actually, John, it, it's worked out. Like, uh, we played at Red Bulls a couple years ago, and okay. Elena and I were, uh, Elena Susmerich, who's also a Penn State grad, we, we were going to drive from 
Hoboken out to Penn State. It's only about a three-hour drive. Go to the game and come back. And cooler heads prevail, fortunately. <laughs> but, um, you know, if not for the pandemic, Leanne and I were going to do a game in Philadelphia. Um, there was going to be a game in May in Philadelphia, which, by the way, it snowed that weekend uh, up in Pennsylvania. Uh, May snow. It was unusually cold. But um, her cousin was graduating from Penn State that weekend, so we were going to do a game in Philly and then, or match in Philly and then go up to Penn State. So if Atlanta United were at D.C., Philly, uh, Red Bulls, New York City, we might even Columbus, we might be able to pull something off. But uh, for for those who are not John and I, uh, <laughs> if you're an Auburn fan, I would recommend flying into Baltimore. Uh, I think that's where you're going to get the cheapest flight. Baltimore's airport a little bit closer than Pittsburgh, about two and a half hour drive from Baltimore to State College. Very easy drive, freeway the whole way. It's beautiful, beautiful drive. Okay. Uh, Pittsburgh's a good one too. It's within three hours. Harrisburg's going to be more expensive, but that's closer. That's about 90 minutes away. State College will probably be too expensive to fly into, and you're going to have to connect from Atlanta, whereas you can fly Atlanta to Baltimore, Harrisburg, or Pittsburgh. Okay. Uh, you know, hotels, John, you, you, you said it. It's 600 a night. You're going to have a two- or a three-night minimum there. So, John, if we go, if it's you and me and Leanne and Patty, I have a uh, hookup on an Airbnb a couple miles outside of downtown. We've stayed there before. We'll split it. That's the way to go, the Airbnb route, uh, because you're going to get killed on hotels. A lot of people uh, will get hotels in Altoona, Pennsylvania. That's about 40 minutes south of State College. But I, I don't recommend that. I, I think you want to be in State College. You want to be able to walk to everything. Right. Uh, it's probably going to be a night game, so you want to be able to walk to everything. You don't want to be driving 40 minutes, even – if you are not tailgating, you don't want to be doing that drive at night because you're going over mountains and everything like that. So, John, we'll, we'll continue this off the air. I don't want to bore our, our viewers, but <laughs> but if you are an Auburn fan, I'd say fly to Baltimore and get an Airbnb. That that would probably be the best way to go. There's, there a, you go. there's a bunch of Auburn fans on the Twitch pitch. I already told them that uh, Plainsman down here is a crappy show. <laughs> <laughs> wow! Yeah. You know what was fun? You know, Georgia State played at Penn State a couple yes. years. Yes. And that was really fun for Leanne. And Leanne actually got her undergrad at Penn State and her MBA at Georgia State. So that was very special for her. But it was a lot of fun being up in State College that weekend. We hung out with Harper LaBelle and some Georgia State people, just showing them, you know, okay, this is campus, this is town, this is how we did things when we were students. It was really a lot of fun seeing it from the perspective of an opposing fan. Uh, and I'm really looking for, I just, God willing, I, I hope we're past the pandemic by September where we can have as normal-ish an experience as possible, and that game can be played with fans because I think it's going to be uh, very, very special. And I know I am certainly looking forward to the chance because I've been to Auburn many times for games, but it's going to be very, very special seeing Penn State play at Jordan Hare in a couple of years. Uh, 2022, that one will be the, okay. the next year. Okay. Yeah, some of those non-conference games got messed up. Yeah. Like They had to cancel a series with Virginia Tech because they couldn't play the first half of it this past year so. I wasn't sure what happened to the Auburn series. What uh, what are your cooking plans this weekend, Mike? We got a Hawks game tonight, so uh, we're going to do uh, a beef cassoulet uh, on Sunday. Leanne got a Dutch oven, and uh, okay. we're going to give a little test drive. So we found a Julia Child recipe that I'm really excited for. It's going to have lots of bacon in it too. Oh, so it's always a good thing bacon. because the the weather on Sunday looks lousy, like rainy all day. Look. So. No grilling for me this weekend. We'll uh, we'll keep it indoors. Very nice. Well, uh, we'll be talking to you next week. We'll, we'll talk some Hawks next week, too. Yeah, oh, that was fun yesterday. And if you haven't seen the No Swag Shop, that's on the 92.9 The Game Facebook page. Jason did a great job as our point guard yesterday. Outstanding. I'm I'm Mark Jackson. I'm not shooting. I'm just passing it <laughs> off. Steve, passing it you're, off. You're like Steve Nash? Scott Skiles. I'll take that one. Steve, no, Nash, Steve Nash scored. Not John. Steve yeah. Nash took a lot of shots. Yeah, Steve Nash could score some points. Scott Skiles, maybe not. Mark Jackson, <laughs> I'm just go. dishing it off. Get it to Reggie Miller. That's all I could do. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Uh, we'll see you. Have a good weekend, and we'll see you next week. Take care, guys. See ya. Mike Conti. Make sure you're following him, Mike Conti 929 on Twitter. 
There are way too many Auburn people who listen to this show, and I'm very disturbed by this fact. But <laughs> you're not even a real Auburn person, so stop I your cackling. In law. You're a fake Auburn person. Yeah, no, yeah. I, like I said, I'm I, I'm perpetually angry at Florida State athletics. So no, I'm an all in in law. That's yeah, not yeah, have. you're just grabbing onto something that that's decent when you look at Florida State these days. Ugh. <laughs> Don't even don't even get me started because uh, no, no no football down here is over on the OSG side of things and that's that's good for seven minute rants at yeah. All right, we got an update from Stephen Goff of the Washington Post. No resolution in MLS labor talks. Uh, quote, and we'll figure out who he is quoting. Although we remain far apart, we will extend 30-day negotiating period by one week until 11.59 p.m. on February 4, the league says. If no deal, MLS Labor Committee has, quote, voted unanimously to authorize the league to terminate the CBA and institute a lockout. That is where things stand. I don't know how far apart they are. Um stop your bluster and just get it done at this point we don't have the things in front of us but what we've heard there's a year that is far apart there's some stuff with free agency um that's where things stand right now get it done people there's no reason for this to continue any further you will not nobody's gonna win here just get it done i don't think it goes to a lockout joe boss i i really don't because the owners aren't going to benefit from that in the even medium term. They might in the short term because they're not paying expenses to do games and not have revenue come in, but that's short term. It's very short term. Um, it might be a few months. It might be half a year. It might be even two-thirds of the season. But doing the kind of damage that that could do for even two-thirds – three quarters of the season, I don't think is worth it. So this gives more time for cooler heads to prevail. I think we saw movement last night or yesterday from the players. This should get done. Um, is You've got another week. That's where things stand. So the players' comments about the extra time to negotiate, um, yeah, they, they could extend it. They could do whatever, whatever that works. Okay, now we know the players were legit in that side of it. The league was very strong on wanting to get it done. They were forcing the urgency. I understand their mentality, but maybe they, maybe there was a little bit of misrepresentation on how hard of a deadline the 30 days was. So they've extended it for a week. Get the thing done and let's move on. I still feel pretty confident about it. I still think that's some more bluster that doesn't help. Eyes on the prize here, folks, and yep. get this done and, and move forward. Um, also, people in the Twitch pitch have talked about it. Uh, it was announced earlier. It was not a surprise. Uh, the New York Cosmos are not going to compete this season. Rocco Camiso uh, bought Fiorentina in Italy, which is having its own problems. And he's not going to fund the New York Cosmos to compete in the lower divisions. I'm not shocked by this at all. The, the Cosmos, since Rocco bought Fiorentina, he... He's not paying much attention to the Cosmos. He's not a long-term guy with the Cosmos. He basically rescued them when they were about to go out of business going into 2017 um, and spent more time fighting with people about things than, than growing anything. And he put his money into Fiorentina. And, you know, the Cosmos, again, if you're in a lower division, it's even harder in this country right now because fans are even more important to your bottom line. And in a a league like Nisa and trying to grow, like, you know, how can you actually make any money at it right now? You can't. You're just sinking costs in. And if he's sinking costs into Italy, which is sunk costs at the moment, because news came out in Italy today that the Italian Federation, the Serie A clubs, are going to approve a postponement of the payment of salaries because players aren't getting paid. Napoli is the only club in Serie A that has paid their players for January. The FIGC is going to approve a measure that will allow Serie A clubs to delay the payment of salaries this season, um, have to have an agreement signed by the players and staff members. Inter have paid salaries for July and August. Um, there are some reports that they had paid September and October 
the only current club up to date on salaries in Italy is Napoli. That's it. That's why Rocco Camiso, if he can't pay his players at Fiorentina right now and his staff and whatever that situation is, he can't fund the Cosmos to play in Nisa this summer. This is where he's like, oh, well, he's rich. Well, yeah, but he's also losing a ton of money, and it's not easy to just keep throwing money out where there's not revenue coming in. The Federation, you know, it's uh, there were the comments as we were talking about before Mike joined us. Well, they, they, sh- they, they shut down the U.S. De- Soccer Development Academy. How are they losing so much money? Well, yeah, that saved them a little bit here, but they made zero on men's national team games. Or I think they actually made just a little bit. Um, in, no, in fiscal year, in the previous fiscal year, they did not. They'll make a little bit for the next fiscal year. It's, you know, it's just what it is. Like, there, there's no money coming in. So it, it's brutal all the way around. It's a big yikes in Italy. It's a huge issue. And I don't know how it all goes away anytime soon. Like, that's why they were trying to sell part of the future broadcast revenues. That's why they're trying to create a new way to do broadcast. That's why Portugal's about to do that. You know, Portugal's about to create, essentially, their own Soccer United marketing between the Federation and the league to do their broadcast and have it centralized uh, because they, they want to make more money. They need to make more money. Italy's doing that, but they're trying to sell part of it right now to bring in money. Mentioned Inter. Inter's ownership situation has another complication with Chinese government changes and allowing foreign investment and things like that. So Suning, who has owned the club, they're going to have to sell at least part of it. And the options on the table, BC Partners might buy the whole thing. They might buy part of it now and start paying off to end up completing the full takeover. They might just immediately buy a majority stake in it now. That's another element. And and that's getting closer to get done. There is a due diligence that started at the beginning of January. Uh, next meeting supposed to be in mid-February to start the process of what that looks like. So... It's all real at the moment, and it's all affecting it, and it's all at the end of a transfer window, and that's going to affect moves that get made. And you know, we've mentioned Aaron Long and the update on him. We've talked about Pitti Martinez. We've talked about Alan Velasco from Independiente, who is in the midst of a transfer ban because they owe six figures to a player. They've got a player that they value at $24 million. Reportedly, there's been an offer, possibly from Atlanta United, according to Juan Arango, or fourteen million for that player. Yeah, you can start to do the math about how all this works. Um, Killing Mbappe and PSG, even PSG, even PSG does not have unlimited money right now, and they have made it fairly clear that they're going to pick Neymar if they have to choose, and they're going to go after Messi or they're going to go after a bunch of other people that could be available. If they have to choose between Kylian Mbappe and Neymar, they're going to pick Neymar. That means Kylian Mbappe could move in the summer. Real Madrid has been linked to him for a long time. Reportedly, they've got 125 million euro sitting in a stash, waiting to use it. But they're also looking at bringing in 300 million euro less than in a normal year. So that 125 million stash, eh. so now they got to move players to be able to bring him in. They could make a player swap and cash. Vinicius is a name that has come up. Uh, Rafael Varane is a name that's come up who wants out of Madrid. Casemiro's name has come up there. Uh, Then on the flip side, for the Liverpool fans, you're getting reports out of France. Canal, Canal Plus's television program, Late Football Club, reported that Jurgen Klopp is pressing Kylian Mbappe's entourage in an attempt to convince him to come to Liverpool. They think, according to the entourage, which is wild that now we're having Kylian Mbappe's entourage (laughs) factor into this, the idea of being the star at Liverpool is like, hmm, if I go to Real Madrid, am I the star? Probably would be, but maybe not as big of a star because the, the whatever. If he goes to Liverpool, they think he would be the guy, the man. Well, does Kylian Mbappe end up in Liverpool? Um, I didn't see that one coming. 
Oh, he'll <laughs> wherever as fast as they can get him yeah. out the door. Sorry, yeah. Mo, but if you're going to pout and if you're going to do the way you've been running your mouth, like, and you can bring in Killing Mbappe to replace you, yes, that is what will stand. Um, maybe he goes to Real Madrid and is not the 125 million euro kitty that they have stashed away. Maybe it's less and they can squeeze it and they can make this work. Maybe that's what happens. Maybe, uh, maybe that's the way they swing it. It's going to be interesting. Another one that could happen this weekend is in Italy. Uh, Ed and Jekko, who we've talked about uh, at Roma, he can't sit with the first team guys at uh, training anymore because he had the falling out with the manager. There are talks reportedly about a swap of Jekko going to enter for Alexi Sanchez. Hmm. Uh, Sanchez has scored just twice this season. Reportedly, Antonio Conte is open to it. Uh, he's been kind of coy about how things are, are going with Jekko. He's, he's, you know, he's not my player. I can't talk about him, et cetera, et cetera. That would be a, a weird move. I mean, I don't know how Inter would shift things around with uh, Jekko and, and Lukaku up top. Would that make you better? Would it just be Jekko comes off the bench? I don't know. That one That one feels a little strange to me, but that's another one that's out there. There's a, a bit of drama in South America over a player at Deportivo Cali, uh, Agustin Palavecino. River's trying to get him, and uh, the reports are that he is a River fan, and that's where he wants to go. River's made an offer. Palmeiras have reportedly made a slightly better offer, but there's interest in Palavecino from Mexico, from Belgium, from Portugal. You name it, there's somebody interested in getting this guy. Um, he is quite in demand, and Deportivo Cali would probably like the check that will come from somebody for him. Keep an eye on on that one. Um, where do you want to go next? I think we've got some more people talking about the MLS situation, which is not a surprise. Uh, Mention Stephen Goff's update. I know the athletic folks are are speaking. And look, I don't think it's hard, and I think most of you have already commented on this. Um, I think you can see where people's sources are coming from in a lot of ways. Uh the athletic has generally been on the side of the players. I don't like what I don't like this comment from the league. I've I've made that clear. I've been on the side of both people getting together and sorting this out. Um, I think the league started out being reasonable. I think they came from a position of no pay cuts, two years extension. That's a reasonable starting point. And I thought the players slow walked it to start the conversation. That was frustrating. The players' response that came out yesterday, and, and look, that's slow walking. I mean, you know, that was the first real counter proposal on a proposal that had been sitting there for a while. All right. That was a very reasonable counter proposal. Now, pushing the button again with talk about potential of this and potential of a lockout and, and all that, that feels unnecessary where we are after yesterday's counter proposal. We're not in the room. I don't believe any of the reporters out there are in the room either. People have already taken their sides, and that's not going to change now. Keep that in mind when you hear some of the commentary about it. The news is the important thing. The quotes are the important things. The proposal terms are the important things. Reporters' opinions, it's opinion. Mm -hmm. And, it's, and it, it can be grounded in fact, but it's opinion. We're given opinion. We don't have all the facts. I'm not going to tell you that we do. I think they have hit a reasonable part, and I think the league went too unreasonable with that quote that came from Stephen Goff. If that is accurate from the league, I, I think they're pushing too hard now. I think they've they've gotten progress. Is it bluster? Yeah. Is it too much? I think it is. And generally, I thought the players were the ones slow walking it up to this point. But they gave a good counter proposal. Get it done. That's the important yep. thing. Get it done and stop punching each other in the arm. I don't want to see the bruises get bigger. But yeah, you're going to get a lot of people who have already chosen their sides, 
And there's a lot of people who do not like the league at all. There's a lot of people who do not like the league's decisions. There's a lot of people who, for some reason, in this league, in this country, are anti MLS. They are. I've never understood it. It does nothing to grow the game, and it affects how people feel about it. It does cloud opinion, but that's opinion, and that's fine. And if you think the other way about it, and you think the players are completely unreasonable, that's your opinion. Right now, I think both have been unreasonable at different points, and at this point, they need to solve it because I think the players' counterproposal came from a reasonable place. It was a good-faith counterproposal to the league's original proposal. It took too long to get there. Yes. It should not have taken that long. But that's how these negotiations go, right? You wait till the very end, and then you put it out there. You, you call in their bluff to say, like, you know, well... You said it was a hard deadline, so we're giving you a counter proposal less than 12 hours before the deadline. If it's a hard deadline, you got to take it or leave it. So they got their bluff called. Okay? They extended the deadline. Now you got to push back because you got punched in the arm. So now you got to punch back and say it's seven months. We're it's seven weeks or seven days. We're far apart. Blah, 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 yeah. blah. You were going to go to a lockout. Blah, 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 blah. Now you got to punch the arm back. Stop with the middle school arm punching. Yeah. You've both bruised the other one. The people who are really taking the bruises potentially have nothing to do with the decision that you guys are going to make. So stop. Let's move on. Don't get distracted by people on the outside of the room yelling and screaming and pointing fingers because they're not making the decision either. And it at times is very unhelpful with some of the framing because it feels like there is a lot of framing going of how it goes but we'll see we'll see what happens um i don't like the way that that came out on Stephen goff's quote i don't think the players acted with enough urgency they need to get this done uh paul tenorio says his take is that the league doesn't want to negotiate a new cba right before or after the the 2026 world cup the one on the table right now would be after, so leave anything else out. Um, it'd be the off-season after. Or you'd be negotiating during it, but again, we know how these things go. They're not going to have a deal done a year ahead of time. They right. never do. It would be done after the 26 World Cup and get done. Um, yeah, I mean, look, Paul and, and Sam both previously worked for the league. That's, that's a known quantity. That's, that's a known fact. And at times, I feel like they're very hard on the league. Uh, they want the league to be better, I do believe. They want American soccer to be better. But at times, I think they maybe play favorites too much. And, you know, it's going to happen because people pick sides. It's what we do, right? It's what we all do. Uh, hopefully, it doesn't affect the actual negotiations, and I don't think it will. But it will affect the public perception. And, you know, I just hope it's accurate. Uh, that's all. I just hope this is all accurate and people are taking reasonable time to look at the situation and it is what it is it's not a good fit thing the players and the league both have bruises on their arms and it's just probably unnecessary um was it going to be easy no because we still don't know what things look like at the end of this season we don't know what things look like in the middle of the season but man i wish they had had a little more urgency on both sides of this I feel like the players wanted to extend it as long as possible to improve their leverage, which I get. And now the league doesn't need to punish them for that. The league needs to be reasonable and say, look, I understand how these things go. Do I like it? No. Would I have liked to have solved this? It had this, this counter proposal back two weeks ago? Yeah. I get how the game's played. Don't negotiate this. And they always do. They do. But don't negotiate this in the land of public opinion. I like the idea of, okay, you're negotiating behind closed doors. There isn't a whole lot of information getting out. Then you come out. Here's your proposal. Everything's happy. Both sides come out and you announce something. Now that you guys have done all of this public posturing, okay, I get it. Great. As you said, they've they've extended their knuckle out of their fist and they pounded into the sh in, into the shoulder or into the muscle in the arm it's like okay great fine you've done that good it's out of your system hopefully get behind closed doors negotiate 
and let's just get this done for the betterment of the of the game. I think that on the show and across the the network, what we have always sided with is growth of the game and positivity where the game is concerned because we understand its importance. And we have talked about both sides and the proposals that we've seen. And I think that for the game, which is what we focus on here, the best thing to do now, stop putting out these full screens on social media, stop doing all this kind of stuff. You've got your sides, figure it out. Don't wait until five days from now. Start putting more stuff on social media. Sit there and announce a sense of urgency after you've already extended things. The sense of urgency is already here. It's already been here. Get things done. Get it lined up so you don't lose everything that you've gained to this point. A lot of folks have talked about other things on Twitter. The one thing on, on MLS and CBA down here on Twitter comes from Tafka. Tafka says another way to look at it is a continuation of the CBA could be a benefit to the players. If the world sport is hurt and the league struggles, the new CBA without extension could be less favorable than it is now. Locking in more years is not necessarily a bad thing. It could. They're not betting on it. Wow, Chara, buddy, relax. Fox Sports is not going to end Atlanta United's coverage if there's a lockout. They have a contract. Chill, chill, buddy. Chill, chill, chill. Don't, don't do that, okay? That's, that's what happens when bluster continues, right? That's what frustrates me to no end. Not you. Not you. The bluster. Because it creates that fear. And there shouldn't be that fear. Nobody involved in this discussion wants to see a lockout. The league should not be threatening it. I'm not happy with their statement at all. It's not necessary. Unless the, the proposal that the players reported yesterday that they gave was not what they actually gave, and I, I believe the players are being legit in what they said. There should not be a threat of a lockout at this point. It's very, very, very frustrating. Um, but when people... Again, then see this, which the league says exactly what Stephen Goff had as a quote. Um, it's unnecessary. The league's creating it now. The players created the, the situations earlier. There's back and forth with reporters involved, too, and they're playing up what they want to play up as well, and it all creates these narratives, and you scare people, and you scare fans, and you scare people who are waiting to work this year, and it sucks. And it's unnecessary because when you're trying to land your little punches on people's arms, like a middle schooler in the cafeteria, I got you back, you got me, I got you back, what you're doing a lot of times is you're missing, you're punching somebody who's an innocent bystander. And that's nonsense. You know, the league says, as, as Stephen Goff had, and Goff nailed it with it, um, the league's issued their statement, uh, we remain far apart. We will extend, although we remain far apart, we will extend the 30 day negotiating period by one week to provide every opportunity to finalize an agreement. There's a paragraph in the middle. We're going to skip in for just a second. They say, given the impact of COVID-19 on how clubs will need to operate in preseason, which is accurate. That part's legit. We must finalize an agreement in the coming days in order to provide teams and players adequate time to prepare for the opening of training camps. Um, Quarantine times is, is the biggest thing here. You've got to have players come in and quarantine ahead of actually starting training camp. If we are unable to finalize a new CBA by 11.59 p.m. on February 4th, the MLS Labor Committee has voted unanimously to authorize the league to terminate the CBA and institute a lockout. I do not like that the league is putting this out there right now in this way. They have to be if they if they are angry at, at how things have gone on the MLSPA side of it, and they feel like they, as they said, what did they describe it? A fair and simple proposal to pay the players one hundred percent in exchange for two years of the CBA. Blah blah blah. Okay, then continue to stay fair and be simple and be thoughtful and not threaten things. The threat does not make this get any better in this way. I really, truly disagree. <laughs> wow, Chara, um, drink some chamomile tea, my friend. You're, you're jumping to about 20 different things, and I don't know what's going on with that. I'm going to leave it alone. Um, this is very, very frustrating, and very, very frustrating that this is where we are at this point. The league does not want to see its investment owners 
and their investments. They don't want to see that wrecked by this. They don't want to lock anybody out. They shouldn't be threatening it. The players obviously want to play. They want to get paid. Um, the league did say they would pay the health insurance premiums for players and their families in the event of a lockout. I'm glad they made that up front. They shouldn't be threatening a lockout in the first place. All of these folks need to grow up. All of these folks need to stop trying to get their shots in. They need to be bigger people. And we've said this all week. We'll continue to say it. It's it's incredibly annoying. And I, I'm really disappointed in the league statement here because I think the league's original proposal was a fair starting point for, for a conversation. I really, truly do. Paying the players 100% of their compensation, there's not many leagues that are doing that right now. Serie A can't even pay their people as they're approved to. Agreeing to pay 100%, you're not going to miss a check. You're not going to have any pay decrease. And in exchange for two years of the CBA, that's a good starting point. And I believe we said it when that came out. That should be the starting point. The players should then say, okay, we don't want to give you two years. We'll give you one year. We'll give you no years, but we'll give you this. That should have been the starting point. The players should not have waited until less than 12 hours before the end of this negotiating period to bring back a reasonable counterproposal. They should have done it sooner. They could have done it sooner. They haven't had a media availability in response to the league's media availability. And again, this is where things get twisted. You can go back and look at the facts of how everything played out. A proposal was given. No response. None. The league gave a media availability to prompt a response. The response was a media availability on the other side. In anger at the other media availability. And it was a lot of back and forth. And no response on the proposal. And then finally, there was a, a response that I don't think was a, a one that solved anything. It, from what the reporting was around the first player's response, it was no extension of the CBA and the players wanted the, the free agency talk. Now, maybe that was incorrect reporting. I don't know, because that doesn't make any sense. Then there was a back and forth. The, pl- the league gave more money into the salary cap in these extended years than originally would have been there. Then the players gave a really good, fair proposal. But when you do it at the end of the deadline, then you get this response. Mm -hmm. Because then it's, well, we gave you a proposal, and you waited till this, and now we're angry, and we're going to punch you in the arm. And it's so childish. It's so incredibly childish. And all it does is scare fans and freak out fans. And you're looking like the MLB's negotiation with with player stuff. It's all absurd. All of it. Just stop. Just stop and go and sit down for a week and sort this out. If it's one year, if it's two. Okay, if it's two, what's the trade-off? If it's one, what's the trade-off? Because that's where you're at right now. You're going to extend the CBA for a year or two from what we've heard from the proposals. Okay. What is the trade-off? If it's two, the players would have to get X, Y, Z. If it's one, the trade-off the league giving back a year to extend it would be X, Y, or Z. Work through X, Y, and Z. Shut up with threats. Shut up with name-calling. Shut up with the back and forth playing out in the media. Shut up with the the megaphones of people who are going to side with you in the media. Shut up with all of it. Be adults and get this done for all the people who are waiting on it. Y'all got a bigger responsibility than you think you do. So get it done. I'm over it. Not talking about it anymore today. Ticked off about all this. Let's move on. Because this is ridiculous. Um couple other things we haven't talked about yet. Real Madrid's got 14 players for their game against the Levante. 14 field players. They got a bunch of injuries. They got players who went out on, on loan in Luka Jovic and Martin Odegaard. Uh, no Sergio Ramos, no Danny Carvajal, no Lucas Vasquez, no Fede Valverde, no Nacho Fernandez. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's bad times for Real Madrid. Um, and they still can't get a deal done with Sergio Ramos. And now it's looking more and more likely like he's going to be gone. Don't know when, um, don't know where. But yeah, it doesn't look like he's going to re-sign a deal. I think he'll finish out the season at Real Madrid. But 
he's got to go. Um, Tottenham's got some problems. They looked really bad yesterday. Really, really bad yesterday. Uh, Liverpool looked good, and it was a win that Liverpool needed. But Tottenham looked worse than Liverpool looked good to me. Um, and that's not knocking Liverpool. Liverpool looked good, but Tottenham worried me more. And now you got Harry Kane out for a few weeks. Two separate ankle injuries? You One injured in each both ankle. of them? One in each ankle. One was uh, off a Tiago hard tackle. And uh, the other was that, uh, once again, it was, uh, I think it was another tackle and the ankle turned underneath him as he was going to ground. And so, yeah, they're looking at each ankle and it looks like a couple weeks. That's brutal. Um, And they can't afford to miss him. I mean, Harry Kane's one of the best players in the world. His partnership with Son is everything in their attack. They're in sixth now. um, And... That top four's pulling away a little bit, a little bit. Manchester City, game in hand on the rest of the top five, and they are one point clear at the top of the table. Manchester United, who was horrendous in their loss oh. on Thursday, or on Wednesday, awful, awful, awful. Uh, they're one point back. Leicester, two points back. Again, Manchester City has a game in hand at the top. Liverpool is now four points off the lead. West Ham's in fifth. Six points off the lead, two points out of a Champions League spot. Tottenham and Everton are on 33, and they have games in hand over the teams ahead of them. Tottenham's played the same number as City. Everton's got two games in hand on West Ham, Liverpool, Leicester, and Manchester United. One on Tottenham and Manchester City. Everton, if they get wins in those games in hand, could really change things. And then Chelsea and Arsenal are on 30. Arsenal, yeah, top 10 again. Arsenal's back into this conversation. They are seven points out of a Champions League spot. Arsenal's going to get a big boost. I think the addition of Martin Odegor is huge. I'm really trying hard to pronounce his name as properly as I possibly can. Um, Norwegian's a little tough for me. But if you didn't see uh, Derek Ray gave you a breakdown, Martin himself gave you a breakdown. Um, I'm trying. I'm, I'm trying to get it right. It is not Martin Odegaard. And that's what it will be in England, I know. And that's not yeah. even close. It, it's, it's essentially Martin Odegaard. Mm-hmm. I think I'm getting it decent. Um, and I, I, Ole's name's a tough one, too. They're all tough. The Scandinavian ones are, are some of the hardest for me. The uh, the Elfsborg preseason game last year. Oh, man, the amount yes. of prep that I had to do to try to get those names right. Yeah, It was it was a challenge. Um, because you had Danish, you had Swedish, you had Norwegian. I think we had a couple Finns in that game, too. Um, Michael Ruiz, I believe, and, and this is coming from Derek Ray, who is the champion at this. Ode Gore, if you want to really break it down phonetically, and, and I needed that too because I was struggling to get it, the end is Gore, mm-hmm. like, like Al Gore. The yeah. D is like di, like dip. And then the O is kind of like the German O with like a, like a umlaut, like Ode Gore. And the, the accent is on the O. Yeah. I'm doing, so. I, and I'm not perfect with this at all. <laughs> like I do the best I can with it. That's as close as I can get it. I'm still saying it over and over again, trying to get better at it. Yep, Martin Odegaard. Yes. All right. So here's what we have left in the queue. Uh, Nathan Pugh early on this morning. He says Tiago looks like he has a red in him. Has he has he been known for slightly rash challenges? That was never part of the highlight reel. Mm, I wouldn't have said that, but. Yeah, um, he has looked like he's got a little bit of a, a red card in him. A um, little bit of an edge. You know, uh, the English game bring that out of you sometimes. Uh, Nathan was also watching an A-League match, Western Sydney and Newcastle. Hope that we can get into the matches soon on a freestyle Friday. And he says, can we discuss the man bun sized elephant in the room? Why isn't Bale getting more of a shot in league matches? It's bizarre to him. He's not earning it. I think Jose's made it clear he's just not earning the time. And if he's not going to earn the time, Jose's not going to give it to him. He's not going to hand it to him. So, uh, you know, uh, if he can't earn the time, he's not going to play. 
It's that simple. And and it scared Real Madrid because they don't want him back. <laughs> and he's yeah. not sticking at Spurs if he can't get into the team. Now, if Harry Kane is out, that might change things. Yeah. And you might have to turn to him even though he hasn't earned the time. And here's a shot. And Real Madrid will be cheering him on. Yay, go Gareth. We don't want you back. Score goals. We want Tottenham to buy you. Please, please <laughs> don't come back. Please. Go play golf over there. It's a shame. And, and you know, I mean, it's a shame that Deli Alley is kind of going down this road, too. And, look, people have different personalities. And you get some guys who are grinders and don't have the, you know, innate just gifts that Gareth Bale and Deli Alley and some players have. Um, I, I don't know what it is about their personalities to where they don't have that grinding element in their mentality. It just doesn't feel like it's there. Um, it's going to hurt them in their career, but not everybody has that. You know, some guys who it doesn't come easy for make more of what they have because of that. And there's plenty of players who it does come easy for and work like maniacs work like absolute maniacs to get better and Bale it just doesn't seem like he has that mentality and Deli Alley now I mean that's the question uh you know you've got two guys at Tottenham right now that kind of have that is that getting through the rest of the squad is that affecting the group when you see maybe your two most talented players outside of Harry Kane and and son like yeah you know we're here yeah we can do this and do that but we don't really want to or we don't really want to work as hard as the rest of you. Like that becomes contagious. And it's a problem. And I know I'm sure Jose hates it. And you gotta solve it. And there's really nothing you can do with Bale because you can't get rid of him the rest of the season. You can't get rid of Dele Alley, and I think you should. Yeah. You're not helping yourself by holding on to him at this point. Even if you can't get the replacement, you're not playing him. So just move on. Just send him even if it's on a loan, if you want to see what happens, like get him away. Send him to PSG. Pochettino wants him. Maybe he can get the best out of him again. Maybe it's just Mourinho when he called him out early on and said, look, I, I want you to work harder. I need you to work harder. I need more out of you. You have it. You're an amazing player. We haven't seen it. And if that has affected Deli Alley's mood and vibe, send him away. Send him back to Pochettino, who he played well for. Send him over there and see what happens. It's not good. It's just not good at all. Um, what else is on the Twitters? Uh, Bartimus Prime uh, linking to a tennis match that happened last night between uh, owners of teams in the NWSL. Yes. Uh, Angel City FC posted, as before the match happened, between uh, Naomi Osaka and Serena Williams. Angel City said this, Okay, we triple dog dare you. If Naomi Osaka wins, we'll donate 100 meals to an after-school program in North Carolina of your choice. When Serena wins, we'll still donate 100 meals to an after-school program, but in L.A. of our choice. Alexis Ohanian comes in and says, I'll still pick up the tab in North Carolina. Let us know. Then after that, Stephen Malik said that they will be purchasing 100 tickets to the first Angel City game for youth players as a result of all of this back and forth. So very, very cool stuff happening in the NWSL with uh, with owners having to watch tennis matches as a part of it. <laughs> yeah, I love the progress that we're seeing on the NWSL side and and just the excitement around everything. Uh, on the women's side, Pia Sundhage has extended her career or her contract with Brazil. Um, she's going to stay through the 2024 Olympics. Uh they need her to because they've got some rebuilding to do on the women's side. They've had a generation that is kind of towards the end of its time, and they need to start rebuilding. She will be vital to doing that, and we'll see them in the She Believes Cup here in a few weeks. Uh, Brazil, Argentina, U.S., and Canada. Really looking forward to that. Um, Copa Libertadores final we have not talked about. It is Saturday, 3 o'clock. You can watch it on the BN Family and Networks. You can also watch it on Fanatis, fntz.co. Slash soccer down here. Uh, that helps the show. If you have not already subscribed, you can get a free seven day trial as well. If you haven't subscribed to check this out, this is a very expensive game, especially for Santos. If you remember uh, our friend Tom Robinson from World Football Index, Santos is broke. <laughs> like they're flat out broke. And the winner of this game, $12 million. You also get a, a spot in the group stage next year that's worth $3 million. You get a spot in the South American Super Cup, the Recopa Sudamericana, 
worth another $2 million. That's against Defensa Justicia, the Sudamericana winners. And you go to the Club World Cup in February, it's worth at least another $2 million. If you get to the final, it becomes more. If you win the final, it becomes even more. Santos, the player that a lot of people are talking about because he's a blast to watch, the, the Venezuelan Jefferson Soteldo, tiny little guy. And he says he is motivated to show that smaller players can be the, the big guys on big teams. He has generated 28 scoring chances in the competition. Only two players have created more, and they're both out. Nicolas De La Cruz of River and Carlos Tevez of Boca. Both teams got a lot of attack. There should be a lot of goals in this game. I would think the over if it's at like 2.5. I would lean to that. But Palmeiras has a really good goalkeeper in Weverton. Um, 33 years old. He could be part of Brazil's World Cup qualifying squad in March. He is incredible against River. 11 saves in that wild game where River was trying to come back against Palmeiras. Also look at young Gabriel Verón for Palmeiras. Uh, Tom Robinson talked about him. He's 18. Nine goals, three assists, and 34 games this season. Manchester City, Manchester United, Barcelona. But Barcelona has no money. Uh, everybody is interested in Gabriel Verón. He is signed at Palmeiras through 25. He'll get sold as soon as the right offer comes in. 50 million plus, I would assume. Like It'll be a big one. He's also, he would have been part of the Brazil U20 squad at the World Cup this year, but that's not going to happen. Offers will start for him in the summer, I would assume. Uh, Santos has some guys who are going to be leaving at the end of this. They were able to extend loans and, and put off purchases until after this game. Luckily, the calendar worked out for him to where guys can still leave in this window and join their European teams, but they need them for this match. Uh, you've got two managers to keep an eye on here. Abel Ferreira, who took over this job. Gabriel Heinze was linked to the Palmeiras job. He didn't take it. Ferreira did. He has never won a trophy as a manager, but he's trying to do what Jorge Jesus did for Flamengo and become a European manager winning the Libertadores. That had only happened one time before Jesus. Um, Mirko Josic from Croatia achieved it with Colo Colo in 1991. So it would be back-to-back European managers winning the Libertadores. On the Santos side, Cuca is their manager. Um, he is trying to become the fifth Brazilian coach to win the Libertadores final for the second time. He won it with Atletico Mineiro in 2013. It's going to be a fun match. I think there's going to be goals in it. I think it's going to be a, a kind of wide-open game. What are the juice boxes saying about this one, John? A couple different things. You mentioned the total. Mm-hmm. So over under at one and a half is minus two thirty nine. Over under two and a half is where it changes to plus one twenty nine. Uh, I want more. Three and a half plus three seventeen. Ooh, that one's tempting because I could see a uh, I could see a two two that that goes on. I could see a three one. Yeah, that that's the sweet spot I think. And then the four and a half is plus seven oh nine. Yeah, you're asking a lot to get there. I, I'm going to go with the four goals in the game, so I'll go over the three and a half. I like that juice box. All right, and then you're coming up with the actual numbers. Yeah, you know the results are kind of big. Yeah, so Palmeiras averages out in the composite to a plus one twenty four. Santos averages out to a plus two forty six. You can get it as high as plus two seventy four, and your draws a plus two twenty. See, but it's tough because Palmeiras is the favorite. They they are the favorite here. There there's really not a lot to put your hat on with Santos outside of they're good going forward, but they haven't been great this year. Both teams played this week too, which which complicates it a little bit. You get plus. 120-ish for Palmeiras. That's what we're looking at here. For a favorite, it's kind of hard not to go there if you're if you're looking at this from a juice box strategy perspective. Palmeiras is the favorite. Palmeiras should win the game. I, if, if I'm picking just a straight-up winner, it's Palmeiras. They're the better team. You know how things can get in the final. You have a player who has created more chances than anybody on the opposition in Soteldo. If Soteldo gets loose in this game, he's going to make things... 
difficult for Palmeiras. They're going to have to be better defensively. They are going to need Weverton to have his, his gloves on the right way in this one. He's going to have to be big in goal because Santos will have chances. Uh, Caio Jorge, the leading scorer for Santos, five times in 11 outings in the tournament. Um, I think it comes down to Soteldo. If Soteldo has a big game, Santos can win it. If he's not at his best, they can't. They're going to need something special from him. Um, I go Paul Maris 3-1. I think Santos makes a game of it. I think Paul Maris gets a lead. Santos, cut, I think it's 2-0. I think Santos cuts it to 2-1 with a moment of brilliance. And then Paul Maris puts it away as Santos opens up. Um, so you changed your mind from soccer over there earlier this week? Yeah. The more I've looked at it, the more I've talked about it. What did I go with there? PK uh, goes to PKs with a draw. Yeah, I, I think Paul Maris gets it done in, in real time. I do. Uh, I, I made my pick on soccer over there. I'll live with it. Um, but if I was actually going to juice boxes now after looking at it more, yeah, I got to go with Paul Maris winning it 3-1 in regulation. Yeah, since uh, you in the weekly picks are ahead of a lot of us since you had the draw with Chelsea and Wolves. Try to tell you. A lot of folks are, uh, yeah, midweek madness. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of my selections tried to make up distance there, and that's why I had Santos. Uh, uh, maybe so. I, I'm, I'm, I may be hedging it a little bit here. Uh, could it be 2-2 two, two and go to extras yeah and go to penalties yeah it could i I, palmera should win should and we'll see if they take care of it It, it's gonna take something special from soteldo i just don't see any other way and you're gonna have to hope weverton has a bad day for palmeras palmeras is the better team i think the better team wins the final here i think they get it done Uh, a couple of other things on the twitters tofka thinks that uh, cameron carter vickers is done as an international prospect he's not even starting for bournemouth now but he'll be a transfer target for mls clubs soon should have went somewhere where he was going to play more, and he hasn't, and it shows. Um, when you don't play enough, your development stalls. It, it's just it, it's the nature of this, and shows right here. It's you got to be careful about where you go, and if you're not playing at that club, you got to get out, and you got to get to somewhere where you can play. And even if that's a step down, even if it's a lower division, like you've got to do that. And he was, I mean, how long was he at Spurs not playing? A long oh, time. wow. Yeah. I mean, he was there for a long time, and I think there was talk about him being reluctant to leave and go out alone or go to another club. And you just you, you can't be that way. I mean, Freddie Adu showed it when he went to Benfica, and he was there, and he just didn't get to play, and he's bouncing around. You know, Josie dealt with it at Villarreal a little bit until he started to move around. Like, you've got to play. It's better to go somewhere and play rather than go somewhere and sit. And, and Kefsi asks about Brian Reynolds. You know, would he go into Roma's team and play? I, I, Kefsi, you follow Roma closer than I do. It, it's not a, it's not an easy answer. Like I don't think he walks into that team and he's starting day one. Now I do think they're looking at it as a long term play, and maybe things look different next year. But yeah, it's a risk. It's definitely a risk. Um, this one is too big of a transfer. Like Dallas isn't going to turn it down, and if he's going to make a million a year, I get it. And if you're looking at it for for next year, then okay, you've got time. He's young, but he's got to play. And if he doesn't, then he's got to get loaned out for his six consecutive loans for Cameron Carter Vickers. Seventeen appearances at Sheffield United. 17 for Ipswich Town in 2018, 18, 19, 30 in Swansea, 1920, 12 with Stoke, 2020, 16 with Luton Town, and now two so far with Bournemouth. At some point, you got to put your foot down and say, I want out. And your, your agent's got to get you out. If you're just going to keep getting loaned out and loaned out and loaned out and loaned out, you got to get out. You got to go somewhere where you can actually have some continuity because, I mean, his development stalled. And that's not good. And look, maybe he wasn't as good as, as people thought he would be. That happens too. Don't get me wrong. But that's not going to allow you to even find out if you're as good as people think you are. If you're just loan, 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 and it doesn't work that way. Um, I think we have gone on enough. Um, okay. Well, we got a couple more. Oh, we got quick. more. Then let's finish. Oh, sorry. All right. Three more. 
Okay. Uh, Nathan, oh, wow. Pugh, Nathan Pugh excited about the prospect of Bron Bron and Mbappe at Liverpool. Mbappe at Liverpool is wild. Uh, Ezra Packham, how close do you think Miles is to being considered to start for the USMNT? What kind of season do you think Barco has ahead of him, and do you think Heinze will get the best out of him and will get a good price? I do think Heinze will get the best out of Barco. Uh, I think the the way that Heinze wants to play will create a lot of space, and Barco's great in space. Barco 1v1, I, I want him to run at people as much as possible. And I think Barco has shown you over his time here, you know, he's developed into a better defender, a more willing defender, a, actually a very willing defender. I don't know if he was unwilling before, but he's a very willing defender. He will, he'll put in the work off the ball. But you want to give him space, and this system will give him the space to operate in, and that will make it easier to pick a pass. It'll give him the opportunity to beat people 1v1 and look for his own shot too. It'll get him back to where he was in early 2019, I think. Um, he's got to stay healthy, and we know that's been a challenge, and that's the unpredictable element here. But on paper, Gabriel Heinze can get the best out of Barco, which would increase his sale price, which would make that more likely at some point soon, which I think is what everybody eventually wants. Um, on Miles with the national team, I I think that there's an impression that you have to be playing in Europe to, to be starting for the USMNT these days. Miles has the raw characteristics to where I, I, I think he can pair up well with John Anthony Brooks. I, I think he could be a, a good partner for him, at least as good as Aaron Long has been. I think Miles gives you more. Um, Walker Zimmerman's in a really good run of form, and I, I think Miles would have to beat him out domestically because Walker had an incredible year last year. Um, on the ball, off the ball, defending, all of it, he was in, just outstanding. So Miles has got to be better than him because Brooks is one with the national team. I mean, Brooks is, is number one center back. Who pairs with him? It's an open discussion. Um, I think Walker really deserves a shot after the year he had. Miles has got to continue to grind. He's just got to continue to do the things that I think Gabriel Heinze will be looking to bring out of him. He's got to be even better on the ball, which he's improved a lot. He's, he's fine on the ball. He's got to be good on the ball. That's the next step. He's got to be good on the ball and take that next jump to where then he's breaking more lines, which he's done not consistently enough. He's got to have that big switch on. He's got to read the game and when to step and go. Defensively, he's as good of a defender as you're going to find. 1v1, excellent. Um, he got back to his form by the middle of the season. He, he dipped early. He was dealing with some injuries. He was good by the end, really good by the end, back to 2019 form. He's got to be there and step beyond it in 21, in my opinion. Um, he can get there. I think he can absolutely get there. Uh, WC Core asked about uh, how bullish I am on Richards. I want to see more. Um, he's bounced a little bit with you know playing out in the right and playing center back. I want to see more. I, I think he's probably in... You know, it's such a crazy year that it's hard to, to fault anybody. I think he's probably another one who needs to go somewhere and be a day-to-day -day starter and know that he's playing every week and, and, and build his game a little bit more. He just needs more time. If he lives up to his potential, he could be better than Miles, better than Zimmerman, better than Long, and be the number two. He's not there yet. And I, I don't think it's even fair to put him there yet because of just the amount of time. I, I want to see him more on a regular basis. Uh, raw materials, yeah, he could be he could be the number two, but he hasn't won it yet. Um, I'll be curious to see what Bayern does with him next year. You know, loaning him to a mid-table Bundesliga team might be a good fit. Just somewhere where he's going to go and be a starter. That's I think that's what he needs um, to see where he he truly is, but. I would lean to Zimmerman or Robinson or Long, and I, I thought Long was up and down this last year. He had injuries too. I would put it in that order, Zimmerman, Robinson, Long. That's where I fall about the MLS guys. Richards I would put with Robinson, probably at that level at the moment. He can be better, but he's got to live up to the potential. Two more on the Twitters. Tafka on the CBA says, owners better be careful. I don't think the MLSPA is going to blink. The owners choose to play chicken with a lockout. I don't know. I mean, that's the thing is I, I don't know. You know the the players 
said, and, and maybe this is being used against them now, the players said they, they couldn't deal with bigger pay cuts. That was the, the last thing they wanted. That's what they said in June. Maybe the league's using that against them, and I don't like that, but you know, it's the reality in these negotiations. This is not the NHL even where the players will not blink. Players aren't making as much across the rank and file. They can't afford to miss a bunch of paychecks. So I'm not so sure on that, Tafka. And I, I, I hate that that's being used in this way by the league because I don't think the league needed to, to put the statement out they did, not the, not the way they framed it. I think they could have handled it differently because it felt like finally progress had been achieved. And I know it made them angry. I mean... It, Everybody's forgetting it now because everybody's firing off their hot takes and and railing about the league. But everybody's forgetting that the players did not respond for 20 to to 21 or more days, 20 to 24 days, I don't know exactly the count, on the original proposal. They didn't respond. And in the first response really wasn't much of a response. They didn't really come back with a good, reasonable proposal until less than 12 hours before this deadline. And now everybody's like, oh, well, see, the players came back with a reasonable proposal, and now the league's so unreasonable by not doing this. The league got mad, and I understand them being mad. Gotta be the bigger person here in this situation. Because you are not helping anybody by pressing the button of the threat. And it makes you look bad. And you lose the battle of public perception, which was already hard for you, and maybe they've just given up on it because people have already chosen their sides. Now you've made it more justifiable for the people to say, oh, look, the league's being unreasonable. Because right now, I think this was an unreasonable response. I do. I think the players were unreasonable by not responding in any kind of a timely fashion to the initial proposal. Because they were running it down. And I get that. That's what these negotiations do. I don't like it. I think it was unreasonable. They finally got reasonable. Now, is this what we're going to do again? Is it going to be unreasonable and then we get reasonable? Don't keep running it up. Don't keep extending deadlines. Don't keep doing it. Just solve the problem. Just solve the problem. You know, now you, you know the framing of the conversation. You should have had this weeks ago. But now you know. Okay, the players have been willing to add a year. The league wants two. There's about a $50 million, $50, $60 million amount of concessions that the league wanted initially, that the players were willing to give them about half of it by giving one year. Okay, can you solve that amount in any other way? Can you actually talk without threatening one another? And maybe you'll solve the problem. But I don't know if the players are in a position to not blink, Tafka, because of... The rank and file is not in a position to miss a bunch of paychecks. And they made that clear to the league back in June. And I think that's affected the league's strategy. And I don't like it. But I think the players had to know once this started out and with what the league framed their initial proposal with, that the league listened to what the players said back in June. And it's not using it against them in that initial proposal, but they're very cognizant of it. And now they're thinking that the players will blink. And if the players finally came back with a proposal, but you don't need to do it through the threats. That's the problem. Because what happens, yeah, you might get what you want out of the proposal, or you might get closer to what you want because of the threat. You've lost the public perception battle that you might have had already lost before because people have already made up their minds. Well, now you gave them a reason to have made up their minds. And you didn't need to do that. And none of that's going to help next time. It just makes it harder to rebuild it. You could have taken, you could have done, and this is where I'm I'm blown away by this from just a strategy standpoint. You could have announced everything you did in your statement by the league. Everything. And left that last part out. You could have left the last part out. You didn't need to say it that way. It had already been reported that a memo had been circulated. You didn't have to say it. It's already out there. People already know. By saying it, you turned into the bad guys right now. Mm -hmm. And you didn't need to do that. That is bad strategy. You could have said everything you did. We did this. We got a response. We did this. We're still far apart. 
We're going to talk for another week. We want to get this done. Nobody wins from any of this. Blah, 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 blah. End of statement. By threatening the lockout right now in the midst of a pandemic, you have made yourself the bad guy. When some people were already going to call you the bad guy no matter what you did. And those are a lot of people with big voices. And that's, that's legit. Don't embrace it. <laughs> don't, don't say, well, if we're going to be treated like the bad guy, we'll just be the bad guy. Because then you affect other people who freak out, like fans. It's just not smart. It's just not smart, and it's very frustrating. It's probably a lot of bluster. It's probably a lot of the same thing that they've been doing on both sides throughout this whole thing. I hope that's all it is. Because you should not be threatening a lockout right now. Get it sorted out. Don't wait till the end. And now, players, this goes back on your end when the next proposal comes. Don't wait until less than 12 hours before the deadline to give a reasonable response. Can we get past that part of all this? Somebody's got to be an adult. Yep. Because when you wait till the end, you can't reasonably deal with it very annoying one day one more will act like adults what else we got one more before we go because we don't do three hour shows we don't it's true not when we're talking about collective bargaining down here no nope. uh nathan pew if uh, if aaron long goes to liverpool and plays well do red bulls try and sell him or does he just come back and help with the lord willing red bulls non-playoff push uh yeah i mean i would assume there'd be a, a release clause in it for one um that's typically how MLS does its loans out, which they should. It's good business. Um, I would assume that'd be there. It doesn't mean Liverpool makes the purchase. But, yeah, if he turns heads, if he if he turns heads in, in England with Liverpool, with good performances, yeah. other clubs will come in and other clubs will make offers. And at that point, you've got to let him go and move on. You've got, you've got the center backs. I mean, you're going to need to probably get somebody, and there's free agents out there that you can go sign if you're Red Bulls. I don't know what their academy looks like at center back, but you've got Amro Tarek. Um, you've got Nealis. Uh, you added Andres Reyes, the Colombian who was at Miami last year. I mean, you've got three starting level center backs, so you can make it done. You can make it done. Um, Michael Ruiz is, is trying to create a Patreon donation to get us to a three hour show. Boy. We look, let's be real. The amount of content that's going on these days and you guys have embraced all of the world soccer talk. Is it crazy? I mean, we joke about three hour shows. Is it crazy that we it happens? We joked about a point? two hour show when we started. No, we didn't joke about a two hour show. We knew that was going to happen eventually. I just thought it would take a little bit longer. Yeah. Is there a possibility of having a three hour show at some point? Yeah, there is. Um, we got to figure out some formatting things to be perfectly real because. A two-hour show with a lot of talking is a lot of, a lot on my voice <laughs> and a lot on my throat. Um, we'll have to figure out some ways to create some breaks in it and, and figure out what that looks like. But we'll go to the lab. We'll talk about it. You guys have been campaigning. Ragamuffin, shut up with four-hour show. You're getting out of here. I'm kicking <laughs> you out. Um, we will probably do something like this at some point i don't know if it'll be a regular thing it might be every other day i don't know what it'll look like yet i have no idea but yeah um the money does help <laughs> because it allows us to do a little bit more and then not have to take other gigs and do other things and we can put more time into coming up with more content and doing more things so all of it will happen at some point we are not doing a cheesy call-in show steve that is not happening sorry no offense to our our uh, listeners but we're not doing a call-in show. That would take more equipment than I have. And the last time we had anybody call in on the show, John broke everything. Thank you, Rusty. Yeah, pretty much. Um, we'll figure it out. We'll, we'll figure something out. Give us a little bit of time. Um, we got a little bit of time till the MLS season starts because I think that's where it'll be a must when we're talking about MLS games. And, and we're talking about all the other stuff because, look, y'all have helped the show evolve from a show that was just about – soccer teams and soccer things in the South to an American soccer show set in Atlanta to now just a soccer show set in Atlanta. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's important to cover all of the other stuff too, because it all is interconnected. You need to know about Independiente's transfer situation. 
because an Atlanta player is linked to Independiente. Um, you need to know about it from the other side because Atlanta is linked to a rumor of a large purchase from Independiente. You need to know about Pitti Martinez in Saudi Arabia because you know Atlanta needs to get that transfer fee, and I hope they already got it. Like yes. there's so many things that are interconnected now that I think it is important to cover all of it. So we will figure it out. Um, we will think about it and we'll come up with a format that works, but give us some time to ease into it. How about that? Is that a fair deal? And uh, yes, if you want to uh, contribute on, on Patreon and, and Twitch subscriptions and thanks to soccer for good OG uh, for getting on and uh, getting the, the, I believe it was the Amazon prime part of things going. Thank you. Um, if you can do that, it helps us because uh, right now, I don't know when I'm calling MLS games, which is fun to not know. Yeah. It's great that the uh, the day that this thing is going to come down, will it'll be my birthday on Friday, and I might have bad news on my birthday <laughs> of oh, a lockout. God. Please don't do that to me, MLS. Please. Oh, God. I don't need news like that on my birthday. No. Come on, man. Come on, man. Come on, Don Garver. Come on, Bob Foos. Don't do that to me. I'm begging oh. you. Hey, we'll oh. see what happens. Um, Michael Ruiz wants a dollar figure now. Man, um, I don't have one off the top of my head. Let me think about it. Um, if if they go to a lockout on my birthday, Ragamuffin, it might be three plus hours of me screaming at people, okay? And I don't want that either, so don't do it. Um, hopefully it is a celebration day of they got an agreement done and we know when the mm. season's going to start and we can talk about every lineup in the league and who needs to do what and all of the things we will see. Um, thanks to everybody who hung out last night on discord for the Q and a we'll, we'll be doing those too. Um, thanks to all of you just support the show and thanks to all of you who want a three hour show and, and want us to do more content because you guys want to actually consume it. Um, there'd be no point. It's in us very, it's, very, very humbling to, to hear all this stuff. Yeah, there'd really be no is. point in, in us doing any of it if you guys weren't listening to it and telling people about it and getting more people to listen. So, muchas, muchas gracias. Um, gracias totales for everything, seriously. Uh, we will keep you posted over the, the rest of the day on what happens with MLS because we don't know. Um, a lot of people are going to be saying a lot of things and a lot of people are going to be showing their colors about, you know, their sides and all of it. And it's, it's just, it's going to happen. Focus on the facts, focus on what's out there. Um, they need to get it right because it's, it's a, it's a bad spot to be in right now in the game and they need to fix it. And hopefully they do. And hopefully this is all more bluster, but it's some really bad bluster on a Friday. We'll be back for the power hour tomorrow morning, and it'll be just one hour. It is a power hour. It's, it's, it's going to stay as a that's power what, hour. That's why they call it a power hour. It's a power yeah. hour. It is truly a power hour. One. And we'll talk about all the games tomorrow. We'll update you on the games that are in progress and probably more transfer stuff. I would assume there's some interesting things going on this weekend when it comes to the transfer world. So we'll have all that in the morning at 10 o'clock. Follow John on Twitter, OSG Nelson, so he can get his Twitter sorted out. Follow me at Longshoe. We'll share all the latest news that we can. Uh, follow at soccer down here. We'll be back in the morning. Mucha plat, y'all. Mucha plat, y'all.